Josh may open the doors. Matters of privilege and recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Uh, well, good morning, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to all of my colleagues in here uh, and all of those who are tuned in at home today uh, for a uh, very exciting and important Friday session of the Legislature. Uh, I want to begin my uh, remarks and greetings today by congratulating uh, my friend and no stranger to anybody in here, Janine Woldridge, uh, with the release of her book, Living Full Circle, Mr. Speaker. It's a, it's a planner that shows uh, where Janine demonstrates how you can live with balance and intention inspired by the medicine wheel teachings, Mr. Speaker. And they understand the planner is going to be available at local bookstores and on Amazon. And uh, Denise, or sorry, uh, Janine is, of course, the uh, executive director of All the Way, Mr. Speaker, and I've known her for many years through her work together when she was at the Yav Good First Nation. So uh, an exceptional person uh, uh, all around, and I wish her well, and I wish her very, very uh, good success with her book sales, Mr. Speaker. I want to also say good luck and best wishes to the field hockey players this weekend with the University of Prince Edward Island. They're hosting the Atlantic University Field uh, Hockey League Tournament, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our Panthers go in at 9-0, and Mr. Speaker, under the uh, under the leadership of Coach Lacey McLaughlin, and they look to have a good chance, Mr. Speaker, to, to take it home. And I know uh, one of UPEI's most famous legendary field hockey players, Dr. Heather Morrison, will be keeping a close eye on that uh, weekend event as well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, tomorrow I will be in the western part of the province, Mr. Speaker, to uh, speak to the annual general meeting of the Society uh, Cadienne de Francophone Ile de Prince Edward, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's taking place on the Du Bois Road. Uh, often when I go there, I see the uh, Honorable third Leader of the Third Party, Mr. Speaker, who represents a big portion of the Francophone community uh, in his district to 24. And I just look forward to joining uh, President Edgar Arsenault and all of the members, Mr. Speaker, who worked so hard uh, to promote the Acadian and Francophone language and culture uh, in this province. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I was speaking with the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere just on the way in, and both of us will be joining uh, the Women's uh, Network uh, PEI board event uh, tomorrow night at the Trailside, Mr. Speaker. There are two concerts being held uh, there uh, tomorrow at the Trailside. Uh, it's the sixth annual fundraiser to celebrate island women and non-binary folk, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the afternoon show, it's Kinley Dowling, uh, Kira, and Alicia, Alicia Toner. And tomorrow night, uh, we will get the chance to see Catherine McClellan, Josh uh, Raymond, uh, Rachel Beck, and of course, host it both shows by the, as in the words of the leader of the opposition, uh, you know, the, the amazing Irish Mike and Mr. Speaker. So it's a good show. I look forward to that. And I wish everybody in here, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, an interesting and informative day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too would like to welcome everybody back to the House uh, to con conclude the first week of this legislative session and to everybody watching at home or online. Um, this coming Monday is Canadian School Library Day, and that's a day uh, to celebrate the, rule, the central role that school libraries play uh, in the education and the development of the young people of this province. And uh, here on PEI, we're very fortunate to have fantastic teachers but also specifically to have fantastic teacher librarians, and, and they support uh, literacy skills for islanders uh, from tip to tip. I'd like to particularly mention the PEI Teacher Librarians Association president, and that's Al Alison Giggy. And Alison is the librarian at Queen Charlotte Intermediate, and like so many island librarians, she encourages reading and, and uh, literacy skills, and also, for those students to develop creative writing skills. And, and for many years, students from her school and others across this province um, submit their work to an annual Island Literary Awards. And the, her school in particular always gets mentioned because of the number of submissions they get, but also, also the quality. So thank you, Alison, for the work you do, and all teacher librarians and all teachers across Prince Edward Island. I'd also like to, as the Premier did, congratulate Janine Woolridge on the release of her book. I've, um, the Premier really said it all. You know, she's written a book about trying to attain balance in our lives, and that's a challenge for each and every one of us every day. And I haven't seen the book yet, of course. Uh, I think it comes out November the 4th. But I, too, want to congratulate Janine on understanding and recognizing the importance of balance in all of our lives. And I think those who work as public servants um, understand as much as anybody else how difficult that is to attain 
And Janine talks about using tools like contemplation, like preparation and setting good goals um, in order to try and find that balance, that, that elusive balance. So congratulations to you, Janine, for wanting to do that and for wanting to pass on what you have learned to others. And I wish you and your book great success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to welcome everyone back today. Look forward to the proceedings. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I heard from a volunteer firefighter who wanted me to bring attention towards an increase in residential garbage burning in recent weeks. This individual's department has been called into action in the middle of the night numerous times over the last couple of weeks to respond to a situation of garbage burning in a residential area. Mr. Speaker, as you know, and all of us in here, vol volunteer firefighters have often often have families and work full-time jobs. And these middle-of-the-night calls for illegal garbage burning is both inconsiderate and takes resources away from real emergencies that require their attention. I would like to remind Islanders to adhere to the rules regarding residential fires, particularly when burning garbage, so to not tie up the resources of our dedicated firefighters. Mr. Speaker, I also would like to uh, commend the PEI Women's Network for hosting their sixth annual fundraiser, and I encourage everyone to, to partake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for rising today. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody about the legislation. A couple of things. I'd like to ask everybody if, uh, when you're traveling the highways with our diggers and, and windrowers out in the road, uh, please slow down. You see these big equipment traveling um, uh, and give them a lot of room to make sure that they can safely get their crops to the field and uh, get from field to field. But on another note, I'd like to uh, wish all the best to our sovereign, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, she has returned home from having uh, had a visit to the hospital and she's back at her residence, so all the best to our sovereign. But also to give a show to uh, Matthew, he's here today joining us on the page. Uh, he's quite a young man and uh, it's a pleasure to see him here this morning. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today. And uh, welcome all of my colleagues and, of course, everyone in District 10, Charlottetown, Winslow, uh, tuning in. I just wanted to echo the Premier's comments. I uh, wish the best of luck to the uh, UPEI women's field hockey team competing this weekend and hosting the event. Also, tomorrow, uh, Mr. Speaker, a very special day in Stratford. It is the Special Olympics PEI Marathon of Sport. Um, two friends of mine, Darcy Murnahan and Colin Yonker, uh, brought this event uh, to PEI a number of years ago and asked uh, if I wanted to be involved. And of course, I said yes and jumped at the opportunity. Uh, each year, their goal is to raise $30,000, and I believe they've done it successfully almost every year. Last year, COVID did uh, present a little bit of a, a speed bump in uh, the actual event, but uh, tomorrow it is going to be back in person at the uh, Norton Indoor Soccer Complex over in Stratford and uh, the torch has been passed on to uh, Kip Reddy and Ben McDonald, who have done a great job of getting this event up and running. And uh, just want to wish uh, all the athletes the best. It's a very competitive uh, day, a very fun day, but the most important competitive part is how much money they can raise for Special Olympics PEI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Minister of Inf Transportation Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's certainly an honour for me to rise in the House today and uh, bring greetings to uh, all the constituents that may be tuning in from District 6, Stratford Keppock. And, Mr. Speaker, I just want to pick up on something that the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Brighton spoke about the other day, the other day with regards to uh, enabling uh, Islanders uh, to, to uh, extend onto their, their own single dwelling homes, maybe an executive apartment or an in-law suite or something like that. Mr. Speaker, something I, I feel very uh, firm about as well, and I support it wholeheartedly. In fact, in 2015, I did just that. I, I built an in-law suite on for my parents, and um, it was it was wonderful. It was a great experience having them uh, so close and, and being able to look after them, and, and they looked after me as well in many cases. Mr. Speaker, uh, they transitioned uh, to, to uh, well, they, they passed on now. But Mr. Speaker, this past June, I, I had the opportunity of uh, welcoming my in-laws, uh, my other mother and father, into our house. And, uh, you know, having Pius and Doreen McPhee residing with us, looking, uh, uh, looking after us, we out looking after them, and uh, my grandmother, or my grandmother, my mother-in-law, especially uh, looking after my dog Axel during the day while I'm here at work, it's, it's just a godsend. So I welcome them uh, back to Stratford to welcome them into our household. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to send um, 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 a heartfelt uh, hello to my, my longest friend, Danny Harris, who tunes in every day. Danny and I have been friends since we were about two and a half years old growing up in Sherwood. Uh, and so, Danny, I promised I'd say hello, so hello. I'd also like to uh, mention, Mr. Speaker, that uh, on November the 10th, the Crossroads and Area Fire Department will be holding a, a membership drive. 
Uh, it's a tremendous group of volunteers that, uh, that help uh, protect our, our, uh, our homes and businesses in Stratford. Um, so they will be having an open house on November the 10th, and anybody that's interested in, in learning more about uh, the, the great things that this uh, volunteer brigade does, I, I uh, encourage you to attend. Uh, Mr. Speaker, also there was a very symbolic event happened yesterday at the Charlottetown City Hall. Um, three Rotary Clubs, the Rotary Club of Hillsborough Charlottetown, the Rotary Club of Charlottetown Royalty, and the Rotary Club of Charlottetown were joined by Mayor Philip Brown uh, in a flag raising ceremony. And that was uh, um, to end um, uh, polio. And uh, it's an annual event every year, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the World Polio Day this year will take place on Sunday, October the 24th. Um, and Mr. Speaker, polio, as many of us know, has been eradicated uh, worldwide, with the exception of two countries. And the fact that this has been accomplished by administering a vaccine is certainly not lost on me. I hope that the few are also paying attention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Time Valley Shorebrook, the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to rise today to say hello to my colleagues in the legislature and hello to everyone watching from home. Uh, I wanted to just take a minute to talk about something that happens every year, but it's always a little sad. The Compton's vegetable stand is closing for the season today at 5 o'clock. So when I saw this yesterday on Facebook, I immediately texted my partner, Barry, and said, Barry, Compton's is closing. you got to get the pumpkins. Get the pumpkins, because we didn't get any yet. So we rushed out, and uh, we do have our pumpkins. But if there are others at home who might have been you know, waiting, uh, today's the day, because Compton's is closing at 5. So you know, get that done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Monaco, Kilmuir, and the government whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. A pleasure to rise today and uh, welcome on my, to be with my colleagues here today in the legislature, but also to uh, say hello to anyone watching in District 3, Montague Kilmere. I know I think Sharon Murdoch watches quite often down in Gasparo, uh, and I know she had a bit of a health scare there a while ago, so I hope she's doing well. And I know my mom watches every day, and she usually, usually if I'm asking questions, she'll say, I give him give him hell. So <laughs> that's, that's why they're sometimes a little tough. Um, but I'd also like to congratulate, I guess on the topic of Yonkers, uh, the member from Charlottetown Winslow uh, mentioned Colin Yonker. Uh, my youngest, or not my, one of my brothers is married to Colin's sister, Laura, and they just had their baby yesterday morning. So I'm, uh, I now have an, a nephew. Um, and finally an uncle, so that's exciting. Uh, Elliot Frederick uh, Deagle. So uh, congratulations to both of them. I hear that uh, the baby looks a little like myself, so I think uh, I, I'd say, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I think uh, that I'd say Elliot has a very bright future ahead of him there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, happy Friday to all my colleagues and everyone uh, watching from home in uh, Kensington Malpec today. Mr. Speaker, uh, tomorrow a very special person uh, celebrates a birthday, and that is my comms officer, Hillary McDonald. And anybody in here that knows Hillary McDonald knows that she's a very powerful, strong uh, woman, and uh, she does a tremendous job. Uh, we thank her daily for, for everything she does uh, to, to help us out in, uh, in our department. So happy birthday, Hillary. I hope you really enjoy your weekend. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and Third Party House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's great. Pleasure to rise and say hello to everybody watching from Charlottetown West Royalty, and I encourage uh, everybody to get out this weekend on a nice, beautiful weekend and, and uh, try out the Active Transportation Trail. I know the people in Upton Park are very excited about it, and I'll be out there walking or jumping around on it uh, this weekend. So uh, get out there and enjoy that uh, major connection piece. And I do want to say hello to Janine Woolridge too, and I just had a chat with her this weekend and or this week, and um, she's active in promoting the uh, Indigenous language. So quay to her, and and thanks for all the work that she did. And I also want to say this is a special time of year um, in university or collegiate sports again, where it's the fall programs are ending. And we heard it today with the field hockey team. Good luck to them. And the winter sports are transitioning. And these these athletes have missed a lot of time. 
And so they're getting back. They need us there to kind of support them and along their way, especially the women's rugby team as they head over this weekend uh, to play St. of X. They're three and three. St. of X is three and three. And, and uh, winner will be chosen and can move on to the finals there. Top 10 for the first time there at UPEI. So good luck to uh, Tessa Hood and all her teammates there. And uh, it's going to be a great weekend of uh, collegiate sports. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome uh, to everyone from Brighton who is listening. Uh, as you already know here, uh, the residents not only in uh, Brighton but uh, all of Charlottetown really were really lucky that uh, they now are going to get a new uh, Simon Center built. Uh, one could think that was an example of the local residents standing up for themselves and yelling loud that we need the center here and it, we uh, don't want it moved. As it turned out, nobody was really listening. They were just lucky that uh, UPI didn't have space for it, so Charlottetown didn't have any option than putting where it belonged in the first place. So uh, uh, that's too bad because I really do like when uh, when the uh, powers to be listen to listen to the members. Anyway, as as we know, they are building a new center and they're tearing down the old one. Uh, I've been using uh, the good fall days to walk around and talk to my constituents, and one of them brought up a, an issue that isn't the usual health care, you know, housing and what have you. They have teenagers, and they say this. There's no, uh, there's no place for teenagers to hang out in a safe place. You know, we do have the Boys and Girls Club, but it's pretty much full based on people that, kids that really need it, but there's no place for, unless you're doing an active sports. So there's an opportunity for the residents of Brighton. Why not use the old Simmons rink as a place for kids, or for that matter, seniors, to hang out and do active things when the weather is bad. It's there. It doesn't cost anything. It's a drag on the environment to tear it all down and fill up, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, landfill uh, or burn the wood, whatever it is, it should be used. So uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise. Hello to everybody in Mermaid Stratford. Um, we are embarking on another weekend. I'm sure that we're all looking forward to it. Lots of events happening in the communities, and uh, I look forward to attending lots of them this weekend. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd just like to mention and, and uh, just do a big shout out to the Rotary Club of Charlottetown Royalty and the Stratford Area Watershed um, who put in 16 new plots at the Stratford Community Garden. Um, so the Community Garden in Stratford um, is fairly large, it's in my district, and it is fully occupied and it's just great to see them come together and put in 16 new plots where residents will be able to um, take advantage of that ex expansion on the uh, community gardens. And uh, I'd also like to point out and uh, just recognize this is Women's History Month. We've talked about a lot about um, women and the, uh, and the people who have made um, significant changes in our lives. And I would like to recognize that 100 years ago this year, Agnes McPhail was the first women, woman to ever be elected to the House of Commons. 100 years ago. And so that was the first glass ceiling to be shattered. She went on to the Ontario legislature and was one of the first women to be elected there as well. So I'd just like to uh, comment on that. And I'd like to um, just do a shout out to, um, to Pat Mala, who I had the pleasure of having a nice walk with this, um, this month. And she pointed that out. And I think it's important that we don't forget the history and that we, we point it out and recognize it whenever it's possible. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I hope everyone has a great day today. I don't think I missed anybody. Member statements. The Honorable Member from Summerside, South Dive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The housing crisis is impacting every corner of our province. This is not a crisis that only belongs to renters or those who are facing house insecurity or first-time buyers. It's being felt keenly by almost every islander in varying ways. 
I think the minister who seems to support the notion of living in the free market over ensuring affordable housing action needs a wake-up call. Recently, we welcomed a new child into our home, our fourth, and we were forced to reconsider our housing options. We looked at homes and we were scared into staying put and trying to deal with our space constraints. The cost of homes has gone up 36% in Summerside in a single year. I'm a privileged homeowner with two full-time government salaries making up our household income. I doubt I could afford to buy my own home today, and I know many islanders feel the same. Wayne Ellis, president of the PEI Real Estate Association, also said there are overpriced and highly priced units out there, but there is no supply of affordable starter homes in our major centres. No supply of homes for new families to grow into. To me, that says there's no room for PEI to grow, and the problem is spreading to more and more areas. I'm reminded of the sudden realization of the protagonist in Jaws when they realized how large the shark they were dealing with really was. <laughs> Minister, Jaws is the fact that islanders are being priced out of home ownership and affordable rental options are already inadequate. You're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah. Bold action now. We need to do better. It's just as useful to solving this crisis as thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the th official opposition. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Pain is a part of each and every life, and on the scale of hurt, severe dental pain ranks pretty high. I spent much of my working life, of course, meeting people in such pain, and there was nothing more satisfying than eliminating that ache and returning someone's life back to normal. My first-hand experience of seeing how debilitating such pain can be was one of the motivations be behind our caucus's call for expanding the publicly funded dental program here on PEI to cover those on low incomes, including seniors, in order that they could receive treatment both preventatively with regular checkups and cleanings and when they have a dental emergency. Two years in a row in this House, we voted in favour of adopting a budget line supporting the new program and I eagerly awaited details. Crickets. I waited until June of this year to bring it up again and was assured that the program would be launching on July the 1st. A government announcement of the program followed shortly afterwards and I shared the collective sense of relief of many islanders. Two weeks into July, still no program. I was assured that it was only a few days away. July gave way to August and then September, and Islanders continued to contact me and my caucus mates telling us that they were still unable to access services. I brought it up again on October the 1st, and the government response was that the program needed just a bit more time, exactly what I was told three months earlier in July. What was available at the end of July was to register and get on a list and perhaps receive a card. What was not available was dental services. A card does not clean your molars. A card does not fix your cracked tooth. A card does not get rid of your toothache. The program was not operational. It was imaginary. And this sad story is, regrettably, indicative of this government's continued inability to get things done. One day with a broken tooth and the resulting pain is too much. A year and a half of broken promises is utterly unacceptable. Please stop making commitments that you don't keep. It erodes trust in government, and quite honestly, it's cruel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Moraldona and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you know, I'm a proud member of the Moraldona Area Development Corporation, and I rise today to commend a subset of our group who has created, developed, and executed an amazing initiative in our area with a welcome gift bag program, Mr. Speaker. These welcome bags allow our community to welcome permanent residents who have moved into the Morrell area from elsewhere in our province, our country, and across the world. The program is a direct response to a survey we did a few years ago and was identified as one of the top five priorities in our area. It launched in 2019 and we delivered 13 bags that first year. It was suspended uh, 15 months during the pandemic and it was relaunched in this past spring with 20 welcome gift bags having been delivered since then. Thanks to the generous participation of businesses and organizations within our region, new residents receive an assortment of information resources, <coughs> gifts, gift cards, treats, and coupons all contained in a reusable shopping bag. It really is an incredible display, Mr. Speaker. A lot of credit needs to go to Katie Sheen, who is the driver of this initiative. Thanks to the Maryland Area Development Corporation volunteers, sponsors, and the 30s, 
various generous contributors ranging from entrepreneurial operators to major businesses in our area. The Welcome Gift Bag program is a great example of outstanding collaboration with businesses, nonprofits, and organizations in our area. The regional team of volunteers who canvassed for contributions and helped with the preliminary assembly at the outset of this program include Katie Sheehan, Marla Drake, Eugenie Eldershaw, Donna Glass, Lydia Hughes, Addison, Chris and Jen Hutt, Katrin Hutt, Amber James, Sarah Lennart, David McAdam, Angela McDonald, Karen McDonald, Lisa McIntyre, Margaret Andrade, Paula Sinis, and Melissa Trombetta. The most recent uh, batch were assembled uh, just this past spring by Lydia, Dan Hughes, and Katie Sheehan. We hope to begin another wave of deliveries uh, in the next month, Mr. Speaker. Um, the reaction from those who receive these bags has been heartwarming, and I'm so proud of our community for this initiative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of statements. Questions by members, starting with responses to questions, taking this notice, the Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member uh, yesterday from Charlottetown Brighton asked me several questions, uh, one uh, dealing with the track of land adjacent to uh, Hillsborough Park. Uh, Mr. Speaker, currently that, uh, that land uh, is going through the process of duty consult with, uh, with Lunaway. And uh, the second question the Honourable Member asked was with regards to uh, an architect's competition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that actual uh, piece of work is housed with the uh, Department of Social uh, Development and Housing, and I believe the Minister and the Honourable Member have had a previous <laughs> conversation on that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, and the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Wednesday, I committed to bring back additional information to help members in this House uh, better understand appreciation of how complicated uh, parenting time issues are, especially in high uh, conflict situations, Mr. Speaker. It's rather long, more than the 40 seconds of time allotted, so I'll be tabling this and uh, tabling the documents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Honourable Member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park, had asked me some questions on Wednesday regarding uh, if I could excuse the absentees for those who participated in the walkout on, on Tuesday, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, I want to say I commend the students who showed bravery and tenacity as they stepped out and let their voices be heard during the walkout on Tuesday. This is a topic on which uh, way too many women have first-hand experiences. These young women and men showed courage and conviction. We certainly value the voices of our students, our staff, and our teachers. I wanted to rise today to inform the House and the, the member of Charlottetown Victoria Park that I have had correspondence with the public schools branch and every student who took part in the walkout on Tuesday will have their absentee from school that day excused. <laughs> Additional student supports will remain on site at Charlottetown Rural and Colonel Gray High Schools in the coming days ensuring that voices, students' voices continue to be heard and that students feel safe. Uh, secondly, Mr. Speaker, on Wednesday I was asked some questions around water filling stations. Um, yesterday, um, at the start of the school year, our, our public schools branch asked all of our facilities what their needs were as it relates to water filling stations, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to inform the House that that work is already underway. A tender was issued in August for additional water stations in our schools. That tender has closed and is moving forward. We currently have 346 water filling stations in Island Schools. Through the already closed tender, we are adding an additional 65 water filling stations across the system. Stone Park Intermediate currently has five water filling stations. At the request of the school, we are doubling that to 10 water stations at Stone Park Intermediate. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Is there anyone else to respond? Oh, the Honorable <laughs> Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and thank you. I, I love it when you give me the stare, and I feel inclined to do something. So. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to stand and, and, and bring a response to the member from Charlottetown Brighton's uh, question about the architecture competition. We had a great conversation earlier in the summer. Um, There's a number of housing issues that we talked about, and uh, his idea was to have an architecture a competition, uh, potentially even, even national in scope, um, and, and use that to either uh, renovate 
a uh, an existing property or build a new property with, of course, all the, the net zero requirements in it. And so, Mr. Speaker, we've been pursuing that in the department. We're sort of still in, in preliminary discussions trying to identify exactly what the project would be. And I look forward to working with the members from Charlottetown Brighton uh, in the near future to kind of flush out some of the details. Thank you. Anyone else? No? And for first question, I'll call on the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Although it's been said many times during the sitting that our province is challenged in many ways, we are also blessed in many ways. This week in particular has shown how fortunate we are to have young islanders willing to be courageous, as the minister just said, and to fight for better. Yesterday afternoon, our office was contacted by the Child and Youth Advocates Advisory Committee, which is made up of some of those fantastic islanders. In their correspondence, they expressed their disappointment at the draft legislation to replace the Child Protection Act, and they asked a few, con a few questions, and I, I'm going to bring forward some of their concerns here this morning. A question to the Premier. The new legislation removes the existing requirement for the Act to be reviewed every five years. Can you tell us how it is in the public interest to remove this mandated public review of the child protection legislation? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, yesterday at about 15 minutes before question period, I received a copy of the same letter that the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Third Party were uh, uh, named on as well, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I've asked the Minister of Social Development and Housing to go back and find out what is going on, Mr. Speaker. I haven't been privy to the uh, to, to the makeup uh, and the discussions that have been ongoing through that uh, uh, committee, Mr. Speaker, uh, my encouragement would always be and will continue to be let's work with everybody across the board so we can get the very best uh, uh, legislation. Uh, the office of, uh, uh, that we have all worked on together uh, with uh, the child and youth uh, advocate in that office, Mr. Speaker, is one of the great things that we have done as this legislature, and I would like to think that the legislation that corresponds with it uh, will be collaborative and will do what's in the best interest of all, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, and I share, I, I, I wish the same thing, Premier. The Child and Youth Advocates Advisory Committee was also concerned that the Department failed to address concerns it raised during their prior meetings with the consultants. A question again to the Premier. How will you ensure that this feedback is incorporated into the final draft of the legislation? The Honourable Premier. Well, uh, again, Mr. Speaker, when, when I read that in the letter, I asked some questions, uh, certainly in our in our caucus, just because we were having caucus at the time when it came. Uh, you know, the minister, uh, I asked him to get a, a more detailed brief, which I know is working on. He has more information here, uh, if it could be shared, Mr. Speaker. But uh, the legislation is in draft form, Mr. Speaker, and I would suggest, in the interest of all Prince Edward Islanders, if that legislation isn't being uh, what it needs to be for all concerned, that they go back to the drawing board, Mr. Speaker and present legislation here that everybody can support uh, because it's inclusive of everyone. So that's what I would encourage, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I appreciate that answer, Premier. Thank you. The advisory committee is also worried about other young islanders not having a chance to fully participate in the consultation process. And the government has never been shy about using consultation to criticize opposition bills, including our bill to lower the voting age. We now have young islanders, the very people that this legislation is intended to protect, telling us that government must stop rushing this legislation and it must start listening to the voices of island youth. A question to the Premier. Does your government have a double standard on consultation or will it commit to taking the time to listen to island youth and to get this legislation right? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, while it's uh, never perfect and perfection should never be the bar, I do think that we can stand here confidently as a government and as a legislature and say it's the most collaborative and consultative legislative uh, you know, assembly, Mr. Speaker, in our history. Uh, once again, it's not perfect. As it pertains to this particular issue, Mr. Speaker, I would again say uh, I would rather, as we've done with many other things in the past, I would rather make sure it is right and inclusive and gets the views and, and support of all who are concerned in particular those that it served, Mr. Speaker. So I would encourage that uh, committee to uh, not rush something to the legislature because they think it needs to get here for the spring. I would like something to get here that everyone can support and will do what it's intended to do, Mr. Speaker, and make the lives of Islanders better. 
The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thanks, Speaker. We've had some lovely answers here this morning, and I appreciated the statement made by the Minister of Education prior to question period this morning. But when I look back, I see a government that has failed youth. It has failed youth on the right to vote. This government has failed to provide safety and justice in schools. And now this government seems to be failing to incorporate their views in the very legislation designed to protect them. This government claims that youth are a priority, but its words rarely align with its actions and track record. Premier, why should young islanders believe you when you say that youth is a priority of your administration? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I would say again, Mr. Speaker, that I would join the Leader of the Opposition in suggesting to the committee that's bringing forward legislation to make sure that it's right, Mr. Speaker. Our government's not rushing anything to the floor, Mr. Speaker. Rather, uh, I have uh, asked the Social Development and Housing Minister, Mr. Speaker, to uh, give me a full brief on what is going on, Mr. Speaker, and I think that we've demonstrated uh, through the leadership, Mr. Speaker, through some difficult times in this province that the opinions of all matter, Mr. Speaker, and I want that reflected in the legislation just like the Leader of the Opposition does. <coughs> The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Speaker, there are grandparents in the province raising their grandchildren, whom they are deeply committed to. I've spoken to several such people who have opened their homes after Child Protective Services got involved because they wanted what was best for the child. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Can you clarify the rights of grandparents when they are raising their grandchildren? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. and. Um, in fact, uh, grandparents and alternate care providers, so these are other family members or, or other uh, people that uh, uh, take responsibility for a child when it's temporarily re removed from a parent by for child protection services, provide an amazing service, in particular grandparents. And um, when it comes uh, right down to it, Mr. Speaker, when a, a child is taken by child protection services and it's not under the care uh, the official guardianship of Ch Child Protection Services, i.e. the province. In fact, the parent still has the custody and guardianship rights uh, for that child. And in fact, the, this, is, this is the number one issue with grandparents raising grandchildren is uh, they can't sign off on very simple things for, for health or school. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, we're working on in policy right now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In many cases, grandparents are raising their grandchildren because Child Protective Services have already deemed that parent unsuitable to care for the children. Yet I'm hearing from people who live in the fear of upsetting their adult child because they still have the ability to wreak havoc and have that grandchild ripped from their home. Many have experienced this already. Question to the Minister. Why do parents who have already been deemed unable to currently care for their children have the ability to have that child pulled from a stable and supportive home? Honourable Minister, Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And then the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, uh, Park in, in, in response to uh, Foster Homes Appreciation Week, was talking about how important it is to keep children within families and not bring them into the care of the province. And so that's what's going on here. Um, Unless the child is brought into the care of the province, we have a child that has to, and the parent maintains the rights. Um, the other thing that the leader of the opposition was talking about today was the, the rewrite of the, uh, the Child Protection Act. It's a very thorough uh, rewrite of the act. And one of the things we're looking at is a way for the province to allow uh, temporary custody of people like grandparents when they're looking after children without bringing it into the care of the province. And that's one of the reasons that the, the department is so passionate about bringing this legislation forward as soon as they can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm following up from the member's questions, and you just made the argument for why we should give alternative care providers the same rights and protections as foster parents. So as we consider this through a child's rights lens, um, it's very damaging. And the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child was put in place in 1990. Um, it clearly states that children deserve special protection because of their particular vulner vulnerability. Our current legislation and policies in PEI are out of line with this. Children are in a developmental stage, and this inconsistency, the back and forth, the not knowing, the trauma has lifelong impacts. Question to the Minister. Have you spoken to the Child and Youth Advocate about this? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. 
Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, th this is exactly uh, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're trying to uh, fix this gap, Mr. Speaker. And, um, you know, foster families, they, they feel a very particular need when ch children are taken into the care of the province. We need to find a, someone who will who'll welcome them into their homes and look after them. And uh, this was the number one thing identified by alternate care providers, mainly grandparents, is that uh, custody still belongs to parents. So we're in the process right now of changing the Child Protection Act to do this, to make this, to allow this to happen. And Mr. S uh, Speaker, I was very pleased to be uh, both in, in Mill River um, as well as at the Rod Royalty. Uh, Dr. Christina Murray had hosted a, a workshop uh, specifically addressing grand families and grandparents looking after grandchildren. I was able to, to attend the full workshop in Mill River. And Mr. Speaker, I was happy to meet with the uh, Child and Youth Advocate and their representative at both times. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, you say all that, but yet you were ready to pass the legislation in its current form and the Child and Youth Advocate had to reach out to everyone here. Um, so when children are in the care of a foster family, their caregivers have the authority to make decisions in the best interests of the child. I'm wondering if you will commit here and today to make this change so that the children who find themselves in this situation are awarded the same level of care, concern, protection, and consistency as those who are in the care of a foster family. Honorable Master of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, we know we have a, a great draft. It's a complete rewrite of the Child Protection Act has come up a, a number of times today. We're still in the, the consultation phase for that. We're still receiving input. Um, I, I personally think that the, the advisory committee uh, did a fantastic job. They, they have just, uh, I believe it's, it's close to 100 recommendations in their, their review uh, report. And Mr. Speaker, um, the people in the department who are developing these policies and, and working with it have the best interests of the child at heart, and that's what's going on here. And in fact, if you look at that draft legislation, you'll see that the very problems that you're talking about are already being solved, and you're going to see a grandparents and alternate care provider policy coming forward in the next couple of weeks that will fill in the missing details from your point. And I will be very happy to, con to, give you to consult with you on that and have a briefing before we even uh, release them. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our office has re received several calls from families with loved ones who are in the process of entering the long-term care um, process. The long-term care sub subsidy income cutoff is $36,000, yet the annual cost of living in a long-term care facility is over $40,000. Question to the Minister, when was the last time that the income criteria for the long-term care subsidy was reviewed? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, what uh, individuals uh, pay in long-term care Mr. Speaker, it is reviewed on an annual basis. Uh, as far as uh, the exact amount, when that review would have taken place, Mr. Speaker, I'll have to get the exact date and that information to bring it back. But like I want, do want to emphasize, Mr. Speaker, that for each individual in long-term care, it is reviewed on an annual basis with regard to their level of income and if it has shifted. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to be clear, I'm talking about the cutoff that the department sets in order for somebody to qualify for the long-term care subsidy. I understand that they are reviewed every year at a, at a resident level, but not from the government department level. The income calculation for long-term care residents used to, include, used to include exemptions for things such as private medical insurance plans. But this government removed these exemptions last year. I had a constituent reach out concerned that, the, that this increased their monthly payment because of it by almost $150 a month. The options provided to the resident were to cancel the private medical insurance or have a family member pay the difference. Either way, if the money wasn't in the account, the resident was going to be charged an NSF charge of $45. Question to the Minister, why would you remove the exemptions from the long-term care subsidy net income calculation? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as, uh, as a member would be uh, aware, long-term care, so many other uh, uh, services that are provided under health 
or by Health PEI. But I will say, Mr. Speaker, that I do appreciate the member bringing this forward, and I will certainly have it looked into and report back on this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Strafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is not delivered. The calculation is not delivered from Health PEI. The calculation is done in your department because it's in the regulations. <laughs> Prior to the regulation changes implemented by your government, registered retired income funds were exempt because they aren't regular income. They are one-time withdrawals often used to pay the additional cost of community care, which is based on asset assessments. Now, because RIFs are not exempt, some seniors are not even meeting the income criteria because their net income is artificially inflated. The only option is to apply, be declined, then issue an appeal, which will probably be denied again. To the Minister, why did your government change the long-term care subsidy to a denial-first approach? Um, Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the member for the question. Uh, you know, we always have to look at, uh, at what we can do and put Islanders first, seniors first. And I do appreciate the member bringing this forward. And as I had said, uh, Mr. Speaker, in my answer to the previous question, I think uh, it is important for me to receive this feedback. I do appreciate it. I will go back to the department, have this looked into, and report back to the legislature and to the, the honorable member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Strafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I actually did reach out to your department several times, Minister. When I reached out to inquire why the regulations were made, I was told the reason for the changes was driven by feedback to streamline administrative processes to assess eligibility. Question to the Minister. Were these changes intended to benefit seniors or administrators? Because they sure aren't working for the seniors I'm hearing from. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, the member asked, were the changes made to benefit seniors? Were they made to benefit uh, administration? At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, everything, every lens that we look at for Islanders right across the board, it has to be about that uh, individual, that demographic, and uh, those are the decisions, those are the criteria but we do have to look at when we're making any changes, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, uh, I am going to have this looked into, determine exactly, because it has to be about the individual, it has to be about the islander, it has to be about the senior, and determine, okay, why was that done, and bring that rationale back to the department, or back to the legislature, and have the discussion with the department on this. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The recent introduction of public transportation between Surrey, Three Rivers and Charlottetown is a great step towards island-wide public transportation that will connect, if not from tip to tip, at least the most eastern and western towns. Three round trips a day are promised. Question to the Minister of Public Transportation and Infrastructure. Please explain how the three round trips are going to work for people trying to commute to jobs and appointments in town, not necessarily all being between nine and five. <coughs> the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, thanks uh, to the Honourable Member for, the, for raising this issue. Um, you know, the, the rural transit pilot that uh, we just introduced uh, on October the 12th, I think, is a terrific step in the right direction. I mentioned yesterday the price of gas. Uh, we look again today at the price of gas, and it's gone up another two and a half cents a litre, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and it, there's no end in sight. But, Mr. Speaker, a pilot is, is just that. It, it, it's a starting point. We need to introduce something that uh, is going to be beneficial to Islanders. Uh, we feel that uh, this uh, first stage of the pilot is very important so that we can gain uh, more, more information and data with regards to the wants and needs and requirements from, from the travelling public that want to access the transit system. So, Mr. Speaker, as we move forward, uh, we hope to increase the ridership and, and learn more of what's required and uh, expand the service appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Bright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I completely agree. It's a great step forward. A key component for a successful bus line is the smaller entities feeding the bus from the hinterland. We understand that Kerry, 
a local rideshare company is providing this service. Question to the minister. How is Kerry providing the service, and what will it cost for the, be for the users? Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, uh, th that, that's, <laughs> that statement is actually inaccurate. Uh, what we're working with right now on, on the uh, Kerry uh, side is uh, they have an app so that individuals can actually go online and, and, and book the, um, the, what the, the requirement for, for their trip is. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, could involve uh, um, using carry, such as an Uber part. That's completely the responsibility of, of that rider to get from, from point A to one of our pickup points for the, for the transit system. It could be also uh, utilizing a taxi service or any other means of public transportation to get to where our, our public transit routes pick up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Brighton. Uh, thank you very much, Min uh, Thank you, Speaker and Minister. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, um, so one question is how you're going to get any riders there if you still have to get into your car to get there then uh, you're not really much ahead of the game. Um, so uh, we, we have heard yesterday that uh, uh, local taxi companies have been uh, complaining that uh, you're taking the work away from them. Um, we are, and uh, Kerry is really just another cab company that's unregulated, using an app instead of a dispatcher. How come you're favoring carry over local companies that provide similar services as uh, carry? Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'll repeat again. Um, the Honorable <coughs> Member mentioned earlier, why aren't we uh, um, providing the, the rural transit uh, M more than uh, just those three runs. Uh, and if somebody is working a 10 to 6 shift, why can't they access it at 10 o'clock in the morning? Well, Mr. Speaker, we have to start somewhere. So where we've started is the three routes that we've uh, established to begin with. But Mr. Speaker, certainly the option is there. If an individual wants to access the, uh, the service of, of a private taxi company, um, that's at their discretion. They're more than uh, happy to. If, if they want to reach out to carry, and, uh, and book a ride through that uh, service and pay for it themselves, they have the ability to do that as well. The Honourable Member also spoke about uh, if you have to get in your car to go where it's at, th that's an option as well for people. And we are going to look at uh, establishing uh, uh, park and ride lots uh, along our transportation routes so that people can take their car a, sh a shorter distance, park it there, and then get on the uh, transit system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Brighton. It is difficult uh, to get ridership established for bus lines, and uh, I bet the cost of the bus lines you have right now is going to be considerable. Probably, um, you know, like $25 a ride or something like that, even though only pay two. In, in, in Ontario, municipality addressed this problem by hiring Uber to provide transportation instead of the more expensive bus system. Um, so question to the minister, why are you not using, why are you using uh, an expensive and private uh, bus company to, to provide the service when you can use other uh, private taxi companies probably for the same cost and probably offering door-to-door -door service instead? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, so Mr. Speaker, once again, uh, we have introduced a, a rural uh, transit system as a pilot uh, right now existing in, in uh, eastern PEI. Uh, we are also uh, working with uh, a maritime bus on their uh, County Line Express run to Summerside. We're also going to be establishing a western run. Uh, we're going to be meeting and consulting with various other transportation service providers uh, over the next short while, uh, be it uh, Transportation West, uh, King's Transportation, the private uh, cab companies, profit, non-for-profit organizations. Mr. Speaker, we want everybody at the table. We want to work with everyone to have a very, very robust public transportation system here in PEI. 
Because, Mr. Speaker, one of the main ultimate goals of this transit system is to be able to get cars off the road and to reduce our GHGs. And, Mr. Speaker, I think this is a tremendous, a fantastic starting point to get that accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, the province negotiated PEI's first carbon agreement, which offered exceptions for home heating fuel and merc fuel for fishers and farming. PEI's agreement expired at the end of March, got extended until September, and now, with the federal election complete, we need to establish a new agreement with Ottawa. Many islanders are struggling financially, and they are wondering what impact this carbon agreement will have on them and their families. Question to the Premier. Can you provide us with an update on the state of our current carbon negotiations, and when can islanders expect the new agreement to be negotiated? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've actually been negotiating this agreement since the end of the last calendar year. Uh, as the uh, Honourable Leader of the Opposition indicated in his uh, preamble to his question uh, that uh, we were working toward uh, September and then the federal election was called, Mr. Speaker, so there's obviously a gap in uh, time now as the new government needs to swear in a new cabinet, and et cetera, Mr. Speaker. So it would appear we're looking at sometime early into uh, 2022 20, uh, in terms of uh, finalizing that agreement, Mr. Speaker. But as I indicated before, that uh, the agreements that provinces are signing now are different than the initial ones, Mr. Speaker, and there's less and less carve-outs, Mr. Speaker, for uh, the use of fossil fuels, Mr. Speaker, and we will share those details uh, once they're uh, in the process of being negotiated and finalize, Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to bring it here uh, if that is done before this session is, is closed, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I've spoken to many Islanders and they're worried about the rapidly increasing cost of living. While there are rebates and incentives to transition to cleaner solutions, many Islanders don't have disposable income to invest up front and wait for a rebate down the road. Islanders that can't afford to migrate to alternative solutions may worry about how they will heat their homes this winter and how they will put fuel in their vehicles to travel to work. Question to the Premier. What is your government doing to support Islanders who fear a rapid increase in cost of living but cannot access rebate programs? The Honourable Premier. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I think I would be included with the other 25 members in this legislature when I say that I'm concerned when I see the uh, rising cost of fuel and the cost of living, Mr. Speaker, and realize that we'll have impacts here. Uh, I'm not sure what we can do directly with in terms of, uh, you know, reducing the cost of, of, of gasoline, for example, Mr. Speaker, but in the past, government has tried to work with organizations like the Salvation Army and others to provide some relief uh, in times like this, and that is what we're looking at uh, now, Mr. Speaker, as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, going forward, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, part of the process in terms of uh, the price on carbon is designed for these costs to be higher, so we change the attitudes and we change what we do, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's why we're trying to offer programs such as heat pumps, etc., uh, to lessen the reliance, Mr. Speaker, on, on uh, traditional fossil fuels the way we've used them, Mr. Speaker. And uh, look, I think quite honestly, uh, everybody here uh, should know and must know that it will be a little bit more uncomfortable before it gets comfortable again, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to pricing. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, your second supplementary. Thank you very much. And as we all are aware, prices are increasing across the board, whether it's food, fuel, vehicles, housing, etc. We've seen inflation rates in Canada at an 18-year high at 4.1 percent, and PEI is leading the country at 6.3 percent. One way government could ease the burden on islanders is by introducing direct rebates attached to prices on carbon. Parliamentary Budget Office report in 2020 said the federal rebate program credits households more than they pay in tax. Question to the Premier. Will you prioritize direct cash rebates to Islanders in the next carbon agreement to ease the financial burden currently being experienced? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think, uh, yes, uh, the approach that we're taking will be different than the negotiated term last time where money was taken to give people free driver's license and registration, Mr. Speaker, which probably uh, ironically encourage people to drive more, which carbon pricing is intended to uh, reduce that, Mr. Speaker. So our, our negotiated uh, deal, when it's concluded, will include a rebate system, Mr. Speaker, where the money collected will go back to Islanders, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A question for the Minister of Health. Earlier this year, a consultant examined morale issues at Hillsborough Hospital. 
Now, we all know that government is struggling with any sense of direction when it comes to improving the delivery of mental health services on PEI. Of course, there's also the mishandling of mental health and addiction services during the early days of the pandemic. To quote from the, the, the Health PEI exit, exit Interview Project, many staff reported that they had little input into changes, and when they did, it was often ignored. Question to the Minister, how can the Minister possibly lead pos positive change in health care if frontline staff input is being ignored? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I would have to say, Mr. Speaker, I am proud that at least our administration have reached out to staff and provided that opportunity to them to give their feedback upon an exit. And then we have the information to be able to act upon it, Mr. Speaker, rather than what we had seen from the previous administration, but didn't really seem to have any plan on anything with regard to health care, certainly did not reach out to staff with regard to why are you leaving, what is the reason here, is it personal reasons, is it uh, for, for the variety of reasons that they may be leaving, Mr. Speaker. But at the end of the day, yes, we did the exit surveys, looked at what the recommendations were, and Health PEI will be acting upon them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, they weren't leaving like it was the end of the third period at an Islanders game. Staff also worried about the impact on patients, Mr. Speaker. To quote this from the same report, insufficient communication led to feeling of uncertainty among staff regarding how the changes were going to affect them and their clients and patients. Mr. Speaker, there's been no communication, 22 unfilled position, insufficient supports leads to patient stress. How can we provide the best possible health care services to patients um, if they're worried and concerned? So here's a question to the minister. Um, what are you doing to reduce uncertainty in the system for both staff and patients? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have to reiterate, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the exit surveys that were completed is a prime example of one of the things that, that we are doing, that Health PEI is doing, to determine why are personnel leaving the system. And then to have that information, Mr. Speaker, and to be able to act upon it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, two of the, minister, of the member alluded to uh, mental health services when uh, in his uh, opening preamble. You look at the number of mental health services and the great work right across the board that our health care providers do provide day in and day out. I appreciate it. I'm sure every member in the legislature appreciates it. But when he references addiction and mental health services, there's a tremendous number of them. And I will be adding to it a little later on in my ministry statement. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty, your second supplementary. Well, the, the staff are stressed because there's shortages, Minister, and I need to know what action you're taking. I know you have the information, but what action are you taking now? At some point, we have to talk about safety, and I'll be tabling the health PEI exit interview later on. But to quote from the report, a number of concerns regarding the quality and safety during the change process or a result of new programs designed were also expressed. Mr. Speaker, this is very disturbing and shows a lack of leadership and planning. Will the minister please tell this House um, where the staff were, were they, were they correct in their concerns about quality and safety at Hillsborough Hospital? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, as I'm sure that, uh, that the Honourable Member does realize, that all health PEI facilities, all health care facilities, have to go through an accreditation process. And one aspect of that accreditation process certainly is to look at the safety and uh, the procedures that are in place there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so that is uh, certainly it's uh, it's paramount. It's important, but it is part of that accreditation process, the review that does take place, and then identify what, if any, actions need to be taken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Larry Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Premier has used uh, the health care term, which he's used many times, uh, these medical neighborhoods and homes. And again, a full fleet of services will be provided. Speaker, is this another imaginary tale by the Premier? Because so far, medical neighborhoods and homes are completely meaningless as buildings if they are not staffed appropriately. But since the Premier seems to feel so strongly about uh, these homes, could he please tell the House when will the, these five operational homes be up and running? 
Honorable Premier. Uh, by the end of the fiscal year, Mr. Speaker, at the latest. O'Leary Inverness. End of the fiscal year, Mr. Speaker. You've got 700 vacancies. Where are you going to staff these people, Mr. Speaker? As I said, the Premier seems to think these medical services will be a full fleet of services, Mr. Speaker. And we've tried to point out there's 700 existing vacancies in our province. So where is this so-called fleet coming from? Where is these staff going to be coming from to fill these positions, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Member would care more about Islanders than just simple, silly partisan politics, he would actually listen to what's going on in the discussion in health care, Mr. Speaker. It's about broadening the scope of practice, utilizing the full fleet of service that we have here to allowing them to do what needs to be done to serve Islanders better, Mr. Speaker. We have tremendous, tremendous health care professionals in this uh, province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have a system that we're building that we know will help attract more, Mr. Speaker, as we build it. But it's about utilizing the services that we have, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and not promising them fairy tales, Mr. Speaker, like his government did for 11 years and six months, I believe, Mr. Speaker. Larry Inverness, second supplementary. Mr. Speaker, when we keep talking about these vacancies that exist now, and we're talking about these new medical homes, or imaginary homes, I'm thinking they're going to be, where are the people? Where are they coming from? Our Premier, are you going to be taking the 140,000 people that do have a family doctor, are you going to take those? Uh, doctors away from those people and put them in these medical homes and dilute the whole overall services for all 165,000 Islanders? Honorable Premier. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker. Morrell Dona. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Maria Marion is a very large uh, research vessel, vessel that has been scanning the floor of the Gulf of St. Lawrence for potential under, uh, underground freshwater sources recently, Mr. Speaker. Uh, they are using seismic exploration and electro electromagnetic investigation. These terms can invoke different meanings for different people, uh, Mr. Speaker, especially the fishing industry here in BEI. A question to the Minister of Fisheries. Can you explain exactly what this research vessel is doing off the North Shore? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. There's been a lot of questions around this vessel. It's been off our coast. It's actually a joint research project involving our First Nations, the Department of the Environment, the DFO, and several universities. And what they're doing is doing actually mapping of the, the, uh, the bottom of the ocean to find out if there's reserves out there of fresh water. Thank you. Morel Dona. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I have heard that information, but you, like I have, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I know and certainly in your area as well, uh, there is a lot of concern from the fishers in that area. Uh, that's, that's, that's where they, they make their living. Can you uh, speak to the technology they're using and the impact that would have on the ocean floor? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's a good question. What I've been told uh, from briefings and documents I've seen that they're actually doing high definition uh, sonar or using that type of technology, um, ground penetrating or, or ocean bottom penetrating that will actually map out the, what's underneath the soil. Uh, there's no, I've been told that there no, should be no disruption to the fishery whatsoever and no should be no concern to fishers. Thank you. Morale Donna, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As you can imagine, when uh, people are, are putting those waves down, or, or I understand it, it's a uh, imp pressure impact of air that's going down there, that's where fishers make their living right on that floor where, uh, where, the, where the species are. Um, can you, uh, I guess the fishing industry, I'll say, seemed to be taken by surprise. Um, and uh, I, I think the FA was aware of it. Can you work with the FA? Can you, uh, when these types of, of research explorations happen again, can we make sure that fishers are much more aware rather than having a, a sharp reaction online because uh, they don't honestly don't know the technology behind her or what's going on that's happening right where they make their livelihood. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the Honourable Member is correct. Uh, this information was provided to the province and was provided to the, uh, the PEIFA, and they were aware. Um, but we will make ever, you know, we'll make ever, take every opportunity to make sure that our fishers are fully, fully made aware of what's going on around our waters in Prince Edward Island. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Excuse me. Yesterday, the federal government announced that existing pandemic support programs for individuals and businesses will end this weekend, including the Canada Recovery Benefit. The CRB, which replaced the Canada Emergency Response Benefit last year, was providing income support for those not covered by employment insurance. 
In its place, the federal government says it will launch a Canada worker lockdown benefit, which will pay $300 a week to eligible workers who are subject to provincial lockdown, including those ineligible for EI. We are privileged, Mr. Speaker, in PEI to not be subject to a provincial lockdown, and many jobs have returned. But how many islanders are going to find out that they are not eligible for, P for EI and are not going to be able to find full-time hours? Question for the Premier. Is the provincial government prepared to provide emergency financial support for islanders who are no longer eligible for federal support programs and will not be able to, to secure full-time employment? Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. I think that our province has demonstrated throughout the pandemic, Mr. Speaker, that we can respond quickly and, and are very open to doing so, Mr. Speaker, in this time of difficulty. We've had a great partner with the federal government, for sure, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think we will have our staff, uh, I know they started the process uh, yesterday, just in trying to determine, Mr. Speaker, what exactly the need is, Mr. Speaker, and if we need to step up, Mr. Speaker, like we have before, we would certainly do so. John Paul, member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last year, we asked the minister report, uh, to report on the uptake of economic growth programs by women to ensure there aren't gender-based disparities in economic support. The minister graciously announced that he would have his department collect that data for analysis purposes. Could the minister update the House on the gender breakdown of participants in these programs? The Honourable Minister, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Members. So that's certainly something that the Department has uh, worked on. I don't have anything with me uh, today, but I'll certainly go back and get all the information I can and bring it back first of the week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Oh, statements by members. The Honourable Member, Minister of Health, and wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is critical that Islanders have access to mental health and addiction services and supports that they need where and when they need them. Today, Mr. Speaker, I'm extremely pleased to announce that the Mobile Mental Health Response Service a province-wide initiative to support those experiencing a mental health crisis is now available. The addition of a mobile mental health response service is extremely important and will make a huge difference in the lives of Islanders. Mr. Speaker, Islanders experiencing a mental health crisis can call the recently announced Mental Health and Addictions Access Line at 1-833-553-6983 to speak with a mental health professional such as a registered nurse or a social worker. The caller's situation will be assessed and they will be connected directly to the appropriate care as needed. If the caller is experiencing a mental health or addiction crisis, a mobile mental health response team will be deployed to their location. Mr. Speaker, team members include a mental health professional from Health PEI and a paramedic from Island EMS. And if there is a safety concern identified during triage, police services will also attend to ensure the safety of the client and the staff. The teams are operating seven days a week, 365 days a year, and they are located in Prince County, Queens County, and Kings County. Mr. Speaker, the mobile mental health response teams, and it is what they will do, they'll assess a patient's mental well-being, symptoms, and underlying circumstances, provide support over the phone and in person, ensure continuity of care through follow-up and referral, review and update existing care plans. Other outreach services, aligning and connecting with community mental health services and provide follow-up care, including post-discharge or after parents complete community-based care. Mr. Speaker, there are several goals of the Mobile Mental Health Response Service. Increase client satisfaction, in the quality of care provided, 
increase the time interval between crisis events for individual patients, increase collaboration between emergency and health services, and increase access and coordination of services for clients in need in their communities. We want to decrease the number of repeated inpatient admissions for mental health, the number of calls to 911, and the number of visits to our emergency departments. Mr. Speaker, MetaV Health Services will operationalize the program under the direction of the Department of Health and Wellness and collaborate with the service partners to connect patients with the appropriate care. Mr. Speaker, those in opposition of the service will say that this is privatizing health care. Nothing could be further from the truth, Mr. Speaker. And let me be clear, we are not privatizing health care. Similar to the motion we heard in these chambers yesterday about expanding the scope of practice of pharmacists, we are utilizing our partnerships with health care providers to expand access in this province. What we are doing is working closely with MetaV with their long history of delivering community-based services and mobile integrated health to operationalize this vital service. MetaV Health Services has the tools and the system to ensure that if a situation changes from crisis to an emergency, the appropriate supports can be dispatched safely and dispatched effectively. Having a seamless integration with 911 is an extremely important for the health and safety of Islanders. Mr. Speaker, I anticipate I will hear that the implementation of the service has taken too long. Although I would love to have announced the launch of a mobile mental health response service sooner, we have done our due diligence to plan properly, to work closely with our partners, and to ensure that this service will offer wraparound supports to Islanders to deliver everything they need. We knew we needed to do this appropriately and safely. We wanted to do it right, and we've done just that. Mr. Speaker, we've also heard those opposing police services being involved. The safety of the client and our staff has to be a top priority. To protect them, police services will be engaged, but only when determined appropriately. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, we launched the Mental Health and Addictions Access Line, and we have had excellent feedback on the service. Through this new line, we have already had numerous calls, most of which were handled over the phone. But we have also dispatched mobile mental health response teams with great success. Ensuring Islanders have access to the appropriate mental health supports they need in a timely manner is crucial. I want to thank everyone has, who has worked so diligently to make this service a reality. I want to thank our partners at MedV. I want to thank our employees at Health PEI the employees at Health and Wellness who worked so hard to get this up and going, and our partner police services. Mr. Speaker, I am so pleased to add the Mobile Mental Health Response Service to the list of mental health supports and services here in PEI. Thank you. The Honorable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I almost don't know where to start with this announcement, Mr. Speaker. The uh, minister commented that he wished that he had um, been able to announce this sooner, but he did. <laughs> Twice? Three times? I do believe that this is the fourth time, Minister. So I really hope that Islanders are actually going to get this service this time. The wheels are on the road. So, I will start by saying I've already gotten an influx of um, comments on this. A few things that the Minister has not covered off for us is the logistics of the, how this is going to happen. Um, first and foremost, I have to say 
to those that are working in the mobile mental health unit. I commend you for being patient. I commend you for working through the confusion that you have experienced over the last year. And to the patients that require this incredibly important service, I am sorry that you've had to wait so long. I do hope that this is the time that you're going to get it because you deserve it. You deserve it now. You deserved it a year ago. And I hope this is what is going to work. Mr. Speaker, it is incredibly important to ensure that the people that are answering the phone lines are the people that are qualified to be able to do the work that's required for the people who are making the phone call. My understanding is that there are supposed to be RNs and social workers answering the call. This is a 24-7 call. We need to ensure that that is who is answering the call, but I'm already hearing concerns that that, that may not be true. So here's the challenge. If you can't man an overnight phone line, you are so missing the boat. Most of the calls that come in for mental health crisis comes in after 9 o'clock, come in after 10 o'clock at night. There has to be somebody that is on the other end of the phone that can actually do the triage. They can actually provide the clients, the people that need the service. And Minister, I need to understand what requirements you have sent to Medivy to ensure that qualified people are on the other end of that phone line, because that's what's required. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> we have heard so many times this announcement. I am happy to hear the police are not going to be going out on every single call. I am happy to hear that the people that are qualified to deal with mental health, health crises are going to be there. I do believe that this is the best, that this is best practice, this is what the best practice and currently what's happening now in the research, that's what this shows. We've heard that Islanders, have, Islanders need this. So at the end of the day, Minister, I have to implore to you that you understand how critical this service is. I have to ask you to please understand who is on the other end of the line and that everything that happens, all of the reporting, all of the work that you do, and that the monitoring of this private company that is going to be running the service is actually held accountable for the service that is being delivered to Islanders. You assumed that I was going to talk about privatization, and I'm actually not going to talk about privatization, because at the end of the day, the only people that matter in this okay, is the only th thing that matters here is the Islanders that need this service desperately and have been calling for action for over, well, for years. At the end of the day, Minister, if it's a service that's not delivered by government, it's, prior, it's privatization. But if you insist on getting somebody else to do the job that you're not capable of doing, then you need to hold them accountable which means you need to say what they need to do, how they need to report it, and it is absolutely crucial that you follow up and you do that, hold them accountable. Minister, I appreciate this announcement. I would love to hear on Tuesday from you how many calls have been made, how many Islanders have benefited, because this is so vitally important. And Minister, you need to take it seriously, you need to follow up, and you need to be responsible because at the end of the day, this Minister. is something that only you is responsible for. To the Islanders that require this service, I hope that this is what is needed. I hope that this is what um, you require. And Minister, we will be holding you accountable and asking you follow-up questions about this service because it needs to be done well. It needs to be rolled out. It needs to be done in an appropriate way. So thank you for the announcement, and I certainly hope it's what you've, what you've said it's going to be. Thank you. Downtown West Warranty and the third party house leader. Well, thank you, Minister. And it's, uh, we talked about this yesterday. I asked questions about this yesterday. And just want to be clear, this is not the program that started out with. 
Uh, it's changed, and I don't mind talking about privatization because you've moved in that direction. Because I'm, I'm worried that you can't provide this service, and you got caught in a trap. And this is what we've come out with right now. And this is too important. Okay, you've had enough time. Three, three times you tried to put this. This is the fourth time, um, and here we are. This is an important service, and we've, we've heard about it in the standing committee. Um, I asked questions about, they talked about phase one, phase two, phase three. I asked what phase two and three looks like, nobody knew. We have to get this right, and you have a lot of work to do on this file. Yes, it got off the ground with a phone line. Yes, it got off the ground with some staff, but this is important. And people cannot jeopardize losing trust when they reach out to this phone line. You mentioned um, the, the phone lines will be manned by such people or such people as registered nurses or social workers. So, what, it, what is it? It's a 24-hour service. Who's going to be there at 2 o'clock in the morning? Is it going to be a nurse? Is it going to be a social worker? We have to make sure that, that that's there and that people can reach out and talk to people um, uh, who are in a position to help them right away. Um, Medivy taking over this program and doing, doing things and running it, that, that is a form of privatization. And they will, they will do... They will do all they can, but the government, the government has has the responsibility. Okay, you have the responsibility, and we're seeing this too often with this government. Okay, you have to take responsibility. And mental health and addictions are plaguing our island, and this it, this helpline needs to be there and operational. You moved it from 12 people down to six people. Have you done your due diligence? We'll see about that pretty soon. There's paramedic shortages, there's nurses shortages, and this program cannot fall by the wayside. We will be watching on this side of the House, Minister. Um, this, is a, this is a positive step today. It's a very, very small step for Islanders, and I hope, I hope with everything that you, you get this right and you stay supportive of this program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Mr. Speaker, for almost two years now, island businesses have stepped up to the plate. They have continually complied with the involving COVID-19 protocols. We know it hasn't been easy. And we sincerely thank them for their important role in keeping Islanders safe throughout this pandemic. Over the last two years, our department has continued to find innovative ways to help make things a little easier for island businesses. Today, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce the COVID-19 Vax Pass Impl Implementation Fund. This fund is for all businesses, non-for-profits, and non-governmental organizations that are required to implement the PEI Vax Pass. The fund is available to help purchase a tablet to scan PEI Vax Pass QR codes that verify a person's proof of vaccination upon entry of the business or operation. The, the fund provides up to 75% of eligible costs of purchasing a tablet to a maximum of $525 per tablet. If multiple tablets are required, the fund covers up to $2,100 for a maximum of four tablets. Details to the fund can now be found on our provincial government's website. We hope this fund helps island businesses and organizations feel prepared for the rollout of the PEI Vax Pass Verifier app that is to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so it is certainly good to hear recognition that there are, you know, costs associated with implementing the Vax Pass program for businesses, and certainly uh, supporting them to to get the uh, the tablets that they need to when for when the QR codes do come into play will be an important part of that. Um, I was a little surprised not to hear uh, recognition that there are other costs to businesses as well. Um, many of them are requiring, you know, having extra staff on to be able to check the Vax Passes at the the door, so those are costs that that uh, businesses are incurring. Um, as well, as well, we know that uh, frontline workers have, you know, had to take this on uh, at very short notice uh, and just sort of jump right into it. And there's there's been quite a few challenges and bumps along the way for them. So looking at, you know, what what additional, you know, financial costs, but what else we can do to help support those workers, many of them, um, you know, young workers uh, throughout this process. So I think, you know, this is a good announcement, but I. There's certainly a lot more there that we need to look at to support our businesses and our workers to implement this program uh, as effectively as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I was pleased to see the federal government step up and offer funding to the provinces for the implementation of vaccine passports. Like many other situations throughout the pandemic, the federal government has been able to provide guidance, funding, and funding when called upon, and I thank them for that. The federal standardized vaccine vaccine pass will ensure that those who have done their part to get vaccinated are able to safely enjoy some of the privileges that we've seen impacted by the pandemic. Vaccine passports of vax passes allow businesses to remain open, students to remain in classrooms, and allows people to travel safely, whether it's on a plane or train. They are a key tool in getting us back to a situation where we can begin reducing restrictions and enjoying some of the privileges that we took for granted prior to the pandemic. We've heard situations where people have tried to falsify current form of back passes, and that's my hope that the federal assistance can, we can that the federal assistance we can begin to implement a more reliable system using QR code technology. I thank the minister for this announcement and thank the federal government for ongoing support through this pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as a minister responsible for fisheries, I understand the important role that the fishing industry has here on the island. The Department of Fisheries and Communities continues to closely follow the situation related to the redfish stock in the area of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, known as Area 1. The province recognizes that this rebound of the Unit 1 redfish species represents a tremendous opportunity for all harvesters and processing industries in eastern Canada and to create a new exports and employment for many coastal communities in Atlantic Canada. PEI has a long history in the redfish fishery and our involvement in harvesting and processing dates back to the 1950s and continued until the moratorium in the early 1990s. PEI landed upwards to 30% of the total allowable catch some years while the redfish industry was open. Mr. Speaker, the use and processing facility in Surrey was at the forefront of the redfish fishery back in its day and it created upwards to 300 jobs for islanders and hundreds of jobs on the three vessels that were engaged in the harvesting. The new, new opportunities presented by the recovery and resurgence of this ground fish must be managed in a way that is sustainable and benefits all Eastern Canadian provinces. Mr. Speaker, we know that our catch harvesters, our indigenous communities and seafood processors have been following the recent developments and are expecting equitable and fair allocation of the red fish stock. We do not want to repeat the mistakes of the past when it comes to managing this ground fish species. Mr. Speaker, I have talked with opportunities that have come with the resurgence of the red fish and our province expectation with every federal minister of fisheries and oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard that have been in place since I've been in this role. I can further tell you that I have conversations directly with the Honourable Lawrence McCauley and the Honourable Heath MacDonald. This province, and as a province, we expect clear and transparent and meaningful engagement with the federal government to bring in a management plan that is sustainable for all the future. I await the opportunity for the new federal minister to be appointed and expect a fair and equitable decision of this valuable resource for all Atlantic Canada, our First Nations, and our commercial fishers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we've all been watching the rebound of the redfish stocks with great interest because it absolutely presents an important opportunity for island communities in particular. It's a uh, it's also an example of what happens when we don't manage our resources in a sustainable way, Mr. Speaker, because in addition to the incredible environmental impacts of overfishing, we also had tremendous economic impacts of that. I'm honestly not sure if the minister has actually announced anything, but it's wonderful that you intend to continue pushing for this, and I'm glad to hear that part of those discussions will also be for the continued sustainable use of this industry. I'll look forward to hearing what actually comes of those discussions, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mullary, Inverness, and the third party whip. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, too, as a former Minister of Fisheries, have been eyeing and watching uh, the redfish stocks and biomass increase over a period of time, because, once again, I'm well aware that uh, we had a, uh, a historical uh, access to that particular fishery, as in your own writing, Mr. Speaker, the, the previous uh, use and fisheries plant. Uh, I have also uh, monitored and watched, uh, you know, some of the uh, commercial fisheries that have been added uh, recently. Uh, we have the uh, Arctic uh, surf clams as well as striped bass have been added, and I, th I see that there's a strong component of an indigenous component to this, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, Chief Darlene Bernard in Lennox Island, and uh, so I'm well aware that they are uh, wa willing and wanting to be a partner uh, in any particular uh, redfish quota allocation that comes to the province of Prince Edward Island, and I see that as a great opportunity, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, like the minister had said, uh, I've had also had conversations with previous ministers in my time about this. And uh, so I do expect that there will be a new minister appointed uh, very recently, uh, maybe in another week or so, Mr. Speaker. And I do fully expect that this minister will be on a plane to Ottawa, probably knocking on their door uh, uh, the next day, Mr. Speaker. So I certainly would look forward to uh, seeing that uh, some redfish uh, quota be allocated to Prince Earl. The minister uh, mentioned as high as 30 percent. I don't know how realistic that is, but I would hope that uh, those would be the types of numbers that would be looking at coming to Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. So, so I certainly look forward to seeing redfish quota being uh, uh, harvested on behalf of uh, Prince Edward Islanders, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. End of statements. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. We yeah. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table the Health PEI Exit Interview Project Final Report Findings and Recommendation, and I move seconded by O'Leary and Vanessa that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Land, Minister responsible for Justice, Public Safety, and the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg to, uh, to table uh, answers uh, to questions taken in question period, and I move second by the Minister of Finance, and that the said document now be received and do lie on the table. So the carry. The Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Mr. Speaker, by command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table La Commission Scolaire de la Langue Française 2020-2021 Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, 2021. And I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? No more. Reports by committee, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development, I beg leave to introduce the report of the said committee on motion number 45, referring <coughs> Bill 18 to committee, and I move seconded by the Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness that the, the same be now received and do lie on the table. Pursuant to Rule 110.5 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, I'll be moving the, uh, moving the motion for adoption of the report on Tuesday, October 26, 2021. Shall I carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Member from Mungu Kilmira that the report of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, tabled on October 21st, 2021, be adopted, following the report recommendations being read into the record. Mr. Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly, the Standing Committee on Public Accounts is pleased to present its second report of the second session of the 66th General Assembly. I would like to remind this House that early on its mandate, your committee adopted the following statement of purpose and values, which it continues to follow today. The Standing Committee on Public Accounts is dedicated to improving public administration in partnership with the Auditor General. The committee examines the administration of government policy, not the merits of it. The committee strives to achieve consensus in its decisions wherever possible. Members take a non-partisan approach to the work of the committee. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the previous chair of this committee, the member from Mermaid Stratford, um, and um, um, have been honoured to take over chairship of this committee since May 25, 2021. 
Mr. Speaker, there were a number of meetings through, through the summer, but we have some very significant recommendations to report and we'll be happy to present those to the Legislative Assembly today. Recommendation number one, your committee endorses the recommendations of the Auditor General in both his 2021 annual report to the Legislative Assembly and his report on phase one of the COVID-19 financial support programs audit and encourages all audited entities to implement the Auditor General's recommendations in a timely manner. Recommendation two, your committee is disappointed in the response rate among board of directors to the Auditor General's Crown Corporation's governance survey and recommends that boards of directors participate more fully in any future opportunities to assess and improve corporate governance. Recommendation three, your committee recommends that government consider legislative changes to allow Crown Corporations to submit provisional annual reports with draft financial statements rather than requiring submission be delayed until audited financial statements are finalized. Recommendation four, your committee reminds government that revenue returned to consumers, businesses and municipalities under the Climate Leadership Act should not exceed revenue collected and that the Act specifies the forms in which revenue may be returned. Number five, your committee recommends that the detailed budgetary information on government business enterprises be provided in the estimates of revenue and expenditure in order to improve the accountability and transparency of these Crown corporations. Recommendation six, your committee recommends that government follow the Financial Administration Act and ensure that special warrants are issued before unbudgeted expenditures are incurred. Number seven, your committee recommends that the Department of Social Development and Housing clearly indicate and make public the criteria on which it bases its recommendations on social assistance rates and financial resources exemptions as part of its annual review submission to Executive Council. Recommendation eight, your committee recommends that government consider amending the Housing Corporation Act to establish a multi-member board of directors. Recommendation nine, your committee recommends that the Department of Social Development and Housing review and strengthen its assessment processes across its programs. And recommendation 10, your committee recommends that if the Auditor General needs additional resources to complete the original full audit plan for phases two and three of the COVID-19 financial support programs audit, he consider requesting it according to the terms of the Audit Act. In conclusion, your committee thanks the representatives of the Departments of Finance and Social Development and Housing for meeting with the committee and reviewing the accounts of the province, audit implementation and other matters. As always, your committee greatly appreciates the time and dedication of the Auditor General and his staff towards scrutinizing the work of government and reporting that work to legislators. Your committee congratulates the Department of Justice and Public Safety on achieving 100% implementation of the recommendations arising from the 2018 audit of the Office of the Public Guardian, as assessed, <laughs> as assessed by the Auditor General as of October 31st, 2020. Full and timely implementation demonstrates true commitment to improvement. During the winter spring session, the Minister of Finance tabled on behalf of government a response to the first three reports of the committee. Your committee appreciates this response and the consideration of the committee's recommendations it contained. Committees are an interface between the public and the legislative and executive branches of government. Without a response, the reports that committees put forward and that the Legislative Assembly generally adopts can seem ineffective and one might wonder whether the views, observations and recommendations they contain are unheard by those who act on them. The response tabled last session demonstrates the contrary. In particular, your committee would like to recognize government's initiative in establishing quarterly implementation progress updates to Treasury Board by audited entities. This is a good addition to existing efforts towards accountability. And your committee looks forward to government's response to its report tabled March 25th, 2021, and to this report. Your committee looks forward to continuing its oversight work on behalf of the Legislative Assembly and Islanders. Respectfully submitted. Is there any other members that would like to speak to the report? No? Shall the report carry? Carry. <clears throat> Introduction of government bills.
government motions. Orders of the day, government. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the member from Monaco Kill, New York, that the seventh order of the day be now read. Charlotte Carey. Order number seven, an act to amend the Highway Traffic <laughs> Act, number two, bill number 24, in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Montague Kilmuir that this House do now resolve itself under committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Sean Carey. The Honourable Member from Montague Kilmuir, the Government Whip, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in, in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled Call the hour. An Act to Amend the Highway Traffic Act. 
Uh, Minister, do you have a stranger? I like certainly do, if, if it's permissible. Sure. Uh, we have. Okay. Request a request has been made to has been made to bring a stranger on the floor. Is it granted? Granted. Mm -hmm. Mr. Minor. Oh, Hal shaved. <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> yes, Hal did shave. <laughs> I'd like to have that answered. <laughs> um, could, could you just introduce yourself and your title for answer, please? Uh, Graham Miner, I'm the director of PEI's Highway Safety Division. Thank you. Um, members, we're on Section 2 right now. Is there any further questions on Section 2? Any questions on Section 2? Shall it carry? Carry. carry. Section 3. Questions on Section 3? Shall it carry? Carry. carry. Shall the bill carry? Carried. Carried. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. I move the title. Be an enacted oh, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act. Shall it carry? Carried. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carried. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Yeah. Carried. You earned your money today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, folks. sign the inside. Mr. Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house, having had under consideration a bill to be intentional an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So I carry. Fast. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the, minister, or the member from Moraldona that the 14th or the day be now read. So the carry. <coughs> order number 14, Class Proceedings Act, Bill number 36, ordered for second reading. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the member from Moraldona that the said bill be read a second time. So the carry. Carry, carry. Class Proceedings Act, Bill Number 36, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm expected by the member from Moraldona that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Should I carry? The Honorable Member from Monocule Kilmuir, the Government Whip. The whole House, please.
This is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled the Class Proceedings Act. Um, do you have a stranger you'd like to bring on the floor? We have a, requ a request to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? Granted. Thank you. Morning, Blair. If you could introduce yourself for in your and your title as well for Hansard. Sure. Blair Barber, Legislative Specialist, Department of Justice and Public Safety. Thanks, Blair. Is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause, yeah. section by section, or open it up for general questions? General questions. General questions? Okay. Uh, Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Welcome back, Blair. It's good huh? to see you. I was excited to see class action, action legislation coming forward. Excuse me, it's something our caucus has been pushing for. But I do just have a couple of questions. I'm hoping you could explain in broad terms the difference between initiating a class proceeding under this new piece of legislation versus the way a person could go about it now, a group of people, excuse me, could go about it now. Sure. Uh, currently, under the rules of civil procedure, uh, you can have what's called a representative action, which allows for a representative plaintiff to commence an action. There are certain uh, criteria for what fits within a representative action, uh, but it's under the rules of court, and it tends to be uh, a smaller group, a more, a more defined uh, cause of action, more defined um, set of facts, common set of facts, whereas a class proceeding uh, is much more formal. It's under a piece of legislation, generally. Although in this jurisdiction, uh, currently it's by common law, um, it shares a lot of the characteristics of a representative action, but it also has some of the features that you see in our bill uh, that um, are a little more uh, complex. And I would say class proceedings uh, legislation accommodates um, more complex civil actions by, by representative action. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Can you tell me what elements of the Ontario review of class proceeding legislation were incorporated into this document? Absolutely. Uh, so one of the, pe the, the, the pieces that we adopted from Ontario legislation, first of all, the criteria for certification have been changed to require a court to be satisfied that first, a class proceeding is superior to all reasonably available means of determining the entitlement of class members to relief or addressing the impugned conduct of the defendant, and two, the questions of fact or law common to the class members predominate over any questions affecting only individual class members. That's in 6 sub 2 of the Act, of the Bill. Uh, second, uh, we've included a provision for the early disposition by motion to the court before certification is, hearing is held. If the motion may dispose of the proceeding in whole or in part, that's in section 5. Uh, in section 6, sub 3 and 4, uh, we've included a provision where the court has to consider on a motion for certification whether there is a class action pending in another jurisdiction and whether it would be preferable for the PEI claims to be resolved in that proceeding. Uh, in section 41, there's a provision for dismissal of dormant actions if certain steps are not taken within described periods from the commencement of the claim. In section 38, we included a provision uh, for increased disclosure for settlement approvals and reporting. In subsection 37.5, there's a provision for distribution of all or part of an award on a Cypres basis, if it's not practical or possible to compensate class or subclass members directly. In section 45, we've added a requirement for a plaintiff who receives third party funding to obtain court approval of the agreement. And if approved, defendants may be able to go after the third party funder to recover costs or for security for costs. And finally, in 22.8, we adopted the Ontario requirement that notice to persons in the class proceeding be in plain language. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Blair. That's really helpful. I noticed in the bill there's a number of references to multi-jurisdictional proceedings and the, uh, how they relate to individuals. And I'm just curious if you could give me a sense of what that would look like for people under this new legislation when you're looking at bringing forward a class action that involves multi-jurisdictions. Sure. Uh, well, if there's if there's a if there's a class action. 
uh, first of all, in another jurisdiction that relates to the same cause of action, the same subject matter, uh, the, the, bill re the, the, the Act will require the court to consider whether or not PEI is the proper venue. So it may be that you have an action against a car manufacturer in Ontario, let's say, uh, and there are some PEI parties who also want to commence action with the same subject matter. Uh, the court would look at um, the court would look at the issue and determine whether or not it's appropriate for a PEI class action to take place, or whether Ontario would be the proper form. So that, that's one of the aspects you'd look at. Um, in terms of uh, PEI being a multi-jurisdictional forum for a class proceeding, um, certainly uh, the court, uh, the, the legislation provides for the identification of the class, and it could include people from off island. Summerside will. Thank you, Chair. I do have other questions, but if you have other people on your list, I will. You don't. Cool. I'll keep going. So there was a line that I jotted down. This act does not apply to a proceeding that may be brought in a representative capacity under another act, and I was just hoping you could give me a couple of examples of what, what that might mean. So I, I can tell you that that section in particular is adopted from the Model Act that was developed by the Uniform Law Conference. So um, I can't think of any specific PEI instances where we have legislation that provides for uh, something to be brought in a representative capacity. Um, but the idea behind this provision is to say if there's another piece of legislation that specifically deals with it, that piece of legislation governs that particular representative proceeding and not this one. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry. I, I cannot picture what that means. And I'm wondering if you can give me an example in another jurisdiction. It's just one part that I really didn't get in this bill. Uh, if you, I'm going to have to create a fictional case That's here fine. to prove the point. If, if you had a case where there was a particular circumstance and the legislature of that jurisdiction had enacted legislation to facilitate um, or set the rules for that particular type of civil action to take, to, to take oh, place, that might be what they would do. So they, they would have a specific class of, of plaintiffs or people who are injured they would want to perhaps establish specific rules for that sort of claim, then they might bring that sort of legislation forward. Right, so it's... Summerside will not. Thank you, Chair. So if in the future such a piece of legislation was enacted on PEI, then it would apply here. That's fair. Okay, thank you. Um, Summerside in, will not. Thank you, Chair. In Section 3, um, it allows for a non-member of a class to serve as a representative plaintiff. Is this necessary to avoid a substantial injustice to the class? Well, se Section 3 provides for that only if it's necessary in order to avoid a substantial injustice. Again, this was something that we, we took from the model legislation uh, developed by the Uniform Law Conference of Canada. And I, I think the idea here is that in 99.9% .9 of the cases, uh, you're going to have a representative plaintiff who's directly involved, who has a direct cause of action against the defendant uh, in some cases, um, you might have an instance where there's not a suitable or uh, a capable uh, representative plaintiff, and in that case, there might be room for, for someone to bring the action on behalf of the class who doesn't personally have a cause of action or a relationship with the defendant. Summerside will. Thank you, Chair. So perhaps if it was a group of children or minors or some one who wouldn't be able to bring it forward on on their own behalf? Is that... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that's a, a, a great example, but I'll pull from the United States, uh, often the American uh, Civil Liberties Union will bring actions on behalf, of, uh, on behalf of groups of people. And so if you're looking at an organization like that, and again, if the court could not find, uh, or if there was not a, an obvious representative plaintiff that might be the sort of instance where something like that might be used. Summerside will not. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in Section 19, this section allows class members to opt out of a proceeding. I'm just wondering if you could give me a sense of what the consequences of opting out of a proceeding are. Uh, certainly. What it means is that you're not, you, you, don't, uh, you don't participate in any uh, 
award that's given as a result of the class action, but it also means you're not bound by the judgment in the, in the class action. So if uh, there, let's say there's a product liability case, there's a class action, and there's an award given, but I've opted out. I retain my ability to sue the manufacturer myself and have a separate trial of the matter. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. That wasn't clear to me before. That's interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that. In Section 38, I was wondering, why does the settlement of a class proceeding require the approval of the court? Isn't that different than typical court proceedings that allow and encourage you to settle outside of court? It, it is, uh, and, and this is one of those pieces, um, it's ULCC supplemented by some of the material we got from Ontario. Uh, I believe this is there for the purpose of ensuring that the class members who are not involved in the settlement negotiations, it's the representative plaintiff and their counsel. Oh, I see. So the court's involvement in approving the settlement agreement is to make sure that the settlement agreement is reasonable in the circumstances. Summerside will not. Thank you, Chair. And I suppose it would also prevent uh, a smaller subgroup of the class that's coming forward with a complaint from settling and not including them <coughs> in, in those discussions? Well, the, the way the legislation is set up, actually, you have your, your comp class with a predominant common issue yep. to be tried. But the court can also uh, appoint a, a representative plaintiff for a subclass with a separate set of interests. Uh, so they share in the common interest, but they also have identifiable common interests outside of the main class. And so uh, those, uh, the representative plaintiff for the subclass would be subject to the same rule for settlement. So if they came up with a, a um, settlement agreement with respect to the subclass, it would be subject to the same sort of provision. Thank you for that, Blair. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Um, do you have other no. no. Okay. Just, just, just me. Okay. <laughs> Section 46, Blair. I was just hoping you could explain the suspension of the limitation period. Sure. Um, just one second. I'll just refresh my memory here. No problem. Okay. So the idea here is that because there's a class action that proceeding that is commenced. Um, the right of the class member under, under the statute of limitations is suspended to bring the action because they're not able to while the class action is going on. So the idea is here, um, if I'm a member of a class, this would be particularly important when you don't know that you're a member of a class. Um, your right to bring your own action isn't a uh, prejudiced by the uh, running of the limitation period. Um, try to put that a little more simply. Um, we don't want the operation of the legislation, the conduct of a class action proceeding, to interfere with the rights and obligations of individuals under the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. That's clear. Thank you, Blair. When do you expect this act to be proclaimed? We expect this uh, to be proclaimed sometime in 2022, and one of the reasons why is that uh, the rules of civil proceedings, or sorry, the rules of civil procedure uh, that are recommended by the Rules Committee under the Judicature Act and approved by the Lieutenant Governor and Council need to be updated to accommodate class actions. And so th that group, uh, it's a group of um, jurists and, and lawyers uh, they will get together and they will develop those rules and then bring them forward for LGIC approval. Um, we don't want to have the Act come into force until they've had the opportunity to make the appropriate rule changes. Summerside, well done. Thank you, Chair. Just one more question, Blair, and it's just a general one, but I'm curious, as other jurisdictions brought in class action legislation, I was curious what kind of outcomes they see. Do you see an increase in class proceedings that move forward, because you can, of course, bring forward class proceedings under other legislation. I'm just wondering what kind of impacts you saw. Um, I don't think you can generalize. Um, I think each jurisdiction had a different outcome based on their population, based on the type of work the law firms in the jurisdiction would do. Um, generally speaking, class action litigation or legislation um, 
is an access to justice facilitator. Absolutely. So, um, so I think that would be common to all jurisdictions. It absolutely helps the judiciary as well in terms of the more effective and efficient management of civil litigation in the province. Um, in some jurisdictions where you have a larger population and a larger group of law firms that specialize in class action proceedings, uh, I would say class action legislation definitely facilitated the, the number and um, complexity of class actions. In PEI, do we expect that? No. Um, I don't expect a, a huge increase in the number of class actions, but I, I absolutely expect the access to justice and uh, judicial management of, of class action litigation will be uh, a lot more effective. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. That's a great answer. I appreciate that, Blair. I don't have any further questions, but just a general comment that I really appreciate seeing this come forward. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Shall the bill carry? I move the title. Class Proceedings Act. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? As chair of the, of the committee of the whole house, having had under consideration a bill to be in Titchwell Class Proceedings Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sure, carry. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the uh, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the 17th order of the day be now read. Shall carry. carry. Order 17, Pension Plan Transfer Act, Bill Number 30, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the said bill be read a second time. Shall carry. carry. Bill number 30, Pension Plan and Transfer Act, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. <coughs> this has to now resolve itself in the committee of the whole house to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? The Honorable Member from Montague Kilmore and the Government Whip, Chair of the Committee of the Whole, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be entitled Pension Plan Transfer Act. Uh, we have a request to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? Emily. 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 Do I need to say? <laughs> nice book. If you could just introduce yourself and your title for answer, please. My name is Terry Hogan. I'm the manager of pension and benefits with the Pro uh, Department of Finance. Thank you, Terry. Is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause, section by section, or open up for general questions? General questions. General questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Nice to see you here today. I'm um, wondering if you could uh, just uh, provide the kind of general rationale for why this legislation is required. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Honorable Member. Um, it's basically at the economies of scale. We look at two different pension plans uh, through uh, that, that cover uh, bus drivers, education authority, uh, clerical staff, and maintenance workers, and then also the MLA pension. And uh, so, in order to make it more sustainable in the future and attain, uh, you know, greater economies of scale, we're going to we're going to merge that into the uh, to the public sector pension plan. Charlotte Ann Belvedere. Thank you for that, and, uh, and I appreciate that those, uh, that kind of administrative <laughs> um, um, piece is being taken into account. And, and is, will that be able to be covered within the capacity of the current administration and oversight, or is there any additional required? Go, go ahead, Terry. Yeah. Um, currently, we administer the, the MLA plan already. Uh, we would be taking on the administration of the ESPP plan, which is currently provided by a, a third-party provider. The um, but the, our current staffing contingent would be able to handle it. It's, it has about 30 or 40 retirements a year. We process 400 a year in our current program, so it, it's manageable. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I know that there are transfer agreements that are required for this, um, and, and can you share the timeline on those transfer agreements for this, for this uh, proposed move? The, uh, yeah, this, this uh, piece of legislation is uh, the legislation that enables us to enact on those transfer agreements. <laughs> and the intent is that uh, we would uh, enroll the members at the end of this pension year. And so for the 2022 pension year, we would enact the transfers. It will be staged in the sense that we'll have to uh, calculate the liabilities and the assets, and there will be some potential top-ups required on the, uh, on the uh, funded status to bring them in the line with the pension plan that they're going into. We anticipate that will all be wrapped up by mid-2022. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. And you had mentioned about that kind of liabilities and any top-ups, and I do understand that both plans have a shortfall. Um, can you just sort of speak about how that will be tackled, given that there are some very different requirements there between the current situation and, and what's anticipated in the in the bigger plan? Yeah, the uh, well, for instance, the the, ES the education sector pension plan, the ESPP, is uh, it's in surplus as well. It's just not as much surplus as the PSPP, so it's a top up in that event to bring it to the same level because the pension plan that's receiving it doesn't want to subsidize the move. They want them to be brought, brought in on par. The MLA plan is slightly less than fully funded, but again, it will be brought up to the same level as the PSPP, so there's no subsidy going on. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. So where does that top up come from? That would be coming from the province. Pardon me? The province. Right. Charlottetown so Belvedere. We, thank you. So we'll see that as a line item in the, in the spring budget? As a Maybe a cash. Thank you. Go ahead, Terry. The, uh, the the liabilities for the uh, pension plans are already on the book, okay. book so it's, all, it's going to really move it from a liability of a non-funded or a, a non-guarantee plan to the guarantee plan. So it will be more of a cash or a funding behind the scenes kind of arrangement because it's already on the book because of the guarantee. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Some of the joys of of accounting practices, it's still important that we, we, we do have it on the record, that we understand that there is a shortfall. And, and I appreciate that this is, you know, that the, the, the standards that are for the management of the, of the pension plan are, are, 
are higher to manage the, the risk that comes with, with it. So it, it's, it's good, but there is obviously a cost associated, whether it's an accounting one or otherwise, there is a cost associated. Um, you know, I guess just a couple of other questions, Chair, if I may. One of them is just um, obviously the, the it's, I believe the union, it, it's um, QP is the union for the, the ESB plan. Um, and I, I believe they've already in, voted in favor of, of the, uh, like an agreement for this, this transfer, but they see that there's a value in it in the management and administration. Um, what's the process for the MLA pension transfer? It would be a, um, a transfer agreement between the minister as, as, and, as, the speaker. and the speaker, as the two plan, uh, plan sponsors of the different plans. Okay. Charlottetown Belvedere. So it, so it doesn't need to go to indemnities and allowances, it's not in that Purview. Sorry, yeah, they they they've been uh, they actually recommended this in the initial last year. This this is in response <laughs> to the recommendation from the 2020 uh, INA report, Indemnity Allowance Commission report. Charlottetown Belvedere. Are there any regulatory changes that would be required? A couple for the um, mostly around uh, naming participating employers. Uh, we do not currently have uh, the school boards named for participating employers for the PSPP, for instance, so we'd have to name them. Uh, I, we have to see, I'm not sure if we have to yet for the uh, MLAs because we already have members of the legislature in the, not the elected members, but staff that are in. We, just, we may or may not have to for the elected, elected members as well. Trail Town Belvedere. Thank you. Uh, as somebody who's you know, potential pension is, this is directly impacted. And then I have a personal question around this, which is around the, you know, where pension funds are actually invested. Um, and, you know, I have my own personal um, small <laughs> funds that I, that I manage my own investment for, and I've instructed my pension advisor that I don't wish my funds to be um, invested into fossil fuels. Um, I, I look for a green investment as aligns with my own values. Um, can you speak to um, how these funds um, are managed and invested, you know, in terms of, of ethical investing? Is that is that a consideration for the overall management of pension funds? I, I, I sit on the committee for the, in the, the investment committee, and it's a, a co-mingled investment committee of the MLA plan, the teacher's plan, and the public sector plan. They have uh, filters that the managers use, but there's no stated policy to that effect of uh, uh, a non-fossil fuels or whatnot. So there's no mandate for that, but I know that there's uh, filters that each of the uh, fund managers use to report on that. But they aren't, they aren't obliged to uh, honor any policy. I do have another one. Sorry. So, so I'm, I'm interested in what the process would be to for for to to affect that policy in that case to be able to sort of talk about how um, investment decisions or or the overall investment direction could be. The, uh, the, that, the investment management committee is an advisory <coughs> committee to the minister, okay. so that typically is a body that uh, oversees the investments and the hiring and firing of managers and the setting of the investment policy that gets approved by the minister up through executive council. Charles Chair. Belvedere. Okay, and I, I appreciate that that, that input. Um, again, sort of obviously me as an individual is, is uh, one part of it, but at the other side of it as also as a lawmaker, this is um, you know a bigger question that, that, that is becoming more and more relevant. Obviously, as I said, I see it in the private sector. Um, and when we're looking at, you know, these, these are not small funds, um, even though this particular one may feel small, um, and there is a lot of weight. We saw this just very recently with um, the city of New York making you know, a really groundbreaking decision to, to um, divest from the fossil fuel holdings to the tune of um, billions of dollars, and that sends a really strong signal to the markets as well. So I'm, um, uh, you know, I think again, you know, we often talk about that the decisions we make in here are small because we're PEI, but they are they are impactful within our own space. Um, and um, you know, when we have stated goals here about about the, the signaling that we send with things like carbon pricing or things, this is also a signal. Um, so I'd be interested in perhaps having that conversation in another space, but I, but I thank you very much for the opportunity to ask you today. No more questions from me, thank you. Uh, uh, Minister, you have an amendment? I, I do. So um, uh, it's moved that uh, Bill Number 30 is amended by the deletion of Clause 1 uh, in brackets uh, O and the substitution of the following O. Protected party means a member of the Pension Committee 
a party to a transfer agreement, an education authority, and a trade union, and an agent, advisor, or representative of a trade union or party to a transfer agreement. We'll just take a moment to hand out the okay. amendment to the members. Members, do we have any questions on the amendment? Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, we hadn't had this amendment previously, so I was just wondering if you could just explain the context for the amendment. That would be really appreciated. The, um, the original definition, the intent is we're trying to give uh, protection to the various parties involved. And it, it, it gives, especially on the unions, it gives them license to participate freely. Mm. Oftentimes they tell us that if they don't have uh, some protection, their lawyers just automatically tell them, well, don't, don't play ball because you're, you may be liable. And so they, this is one of the things the union has asked for, and it's quite common. We've seen it in other jurisdictions where they give them uh, protection for these kind of, they're called like onboarding <laughs> exercises. So when we drew up the uh, original protected party definition, we had cited union, and, and we had thought we had covered everything off, but then uh, the union involved, their national office, came in and said, well, we're an agency more than the union, so we added that uh, representatives of a trade union or an agent or a representative, so it's beyond just the union, the elected locals that we deal with, it's also their agents. That was the uh, deficiency in the first definition. Charlton Belvedere. No, thank you for that, and, and, and I, I agree again in recognizing that you have had ongoing discussions with the trade union that represents this, this pension plan, and, and um, um, their involvement remains after <laughs> the mm. transfer, so they need to ensure that they are able to continue to represent their okay. Their, uh, their workers as, as best they can. Um, can you just clarify um, who is the member of a, like a member of the pension committee? Or like who are the members? I'm not sure if we're Well, there'd be, uh, there's various, like the INA commission would be involved okay. there, the uh, pension, uh, public sector pension plan commission, the education sector plan pension committee, all those committees that are quasi, you know, there's employee reps, retiree reps, union reps on those committees. Okay. So it's meant to cover those, plus the unions that are involved as well. Charlton Belvedere. And that's chaired by minister? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to imagine this government's yep. in my head about how this uh, works. Well, the, the SPP is, uh, uh, the, the minister responsible is the minister of education. Oh, so, right, yeah. Okay, so right, there's yeah. a, but that's delegated down to one of their, uh, John Cummings is the chair of the Education Sector Pension Plan. Okay. Uh, Cindy uh, Harris would be the chair of the Public Sector Pension Plan. And uh, I believe Ron Profit is the chair of the INA Commission. Okay. Cheryl Tam Belvedere. No, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, I, I realize that this is the, the, the pension committee is a specific one for this, this plan, which right. would then be, um, so yes, thank you. Just, Following the thread, <laughs> um, I think I'm okay with that that amendment. Thank you, Chair. Any further questions on the amendment? Shall the amendment carry? Yeah. All right. Back, back to the bill. Do we have any further questions on the bill? Shall the bill carry? Yeah. Title. Pension Plan Transfer Act. Shall it carry? Sure, sure. I move the enacting clause. 
be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be in typical pension plan transfer act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same with amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sure, Carrie. <clears throat> Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move the second by the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture that the first order of the day be now read. Sean Carey. Carey. Order number one, an act to amend the Liquor Control Act, Bill number 15, in committee. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture that the said bill be read a second time. Sean Carey. Carey. Bill number 15, an act to amend the Liquor Control Act. Pardon me, this, this bill is already in committee. All right, okay, sorry about that. Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Pardon me, Mr. Speaker, it's been a long time since that bill has been on the floor. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture that, the said, or, that this House did now resolve itself in the committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Sean Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Monocle Kilmuir and the uh, Government Whip to chair the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Liquor Control Act. Uh, Minister, do you have a stranger you'd like I to? I do. Yep. Request has been made to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? introduce yourself and uh, your title for answer please sure I'm Heather Rossiter I'm the director of corporate affairs and regulatory services for the PEI liquor control Commission thank you Heather uh, I think we were, the committee was in uh, just opened up to general questions uh, do we have questions Charlottetown Belvedere thank you, thank you, Hello again. Hello. hi Heather. nice to see you <laughs> um, okay so I want to start with a question regarding the, um, in section one, regarding the, the definition of um, um, the lower alcohol mm -hmm. beverages. We had had previous um, amendments that we had to be, had to be made to this to the act um, to allow kombucha, which was um, um, there had been a lot of kerfuffle, you might remember, where people it had been um, sold and then it had to be withdrawn because it had a, a small alcohol allowance and then there was an allowance made. Does this um, 
still allow for um, products like kombucha to be captured by this definition of liquor as, it, as it's presented in this amendment? So this would allow up to a 0.5 um, alcohol content mm -hmm. to be sold. Um, we have a number of categories of product um, that are being made um, by many manufacturers um, that their alcohol content, where we're zero now, um, they don't meet that threshold. So this would allow for those products up to 0.5% to be sold at general retail as opposed to in our stores. Okay. Charlottetown Belvedere. So in developing this as the, as the kind of a level at 0.5, that's been done in consultation with, with those different manufacturers in terms of the kind of products well, they're bringing forward? So we've looked at, we've scanned, we've done a jurisdictional scan of what's going on across um, liquor jurisdictions across the country. And um, we see that um, many are at 0.5, some are at, one is at 0.7, is one is as high, or two are rather, sorry, as high as 1.0% ABV. Charles, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, yeah, and I, and I know that the average, um, literally just checked it again to make sure I was remembering right, but the average um, alcohol content for kombucha is a 0.5 or less. Um, I guess my concern is, um, I mean, that, that was one that really did trip us up mm -hmm. in the okay. past and that, uh, you know, I, I, I guess my concern is if you have a batch, something like that, where you have a small craft style brewery and they do a batch and it happens to be tested and comes out at 0. 0.6, just because the fermentation process was slightly different, are they going to be, um, you know, are they going to then have their product withdrawn or banned or pulled because of this is such a specific yeah. definition? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes I, I mean, if, yeah. you're, if you're going to be selling to the public, you know, through a retail outlet, it, it, we have to ensure that, uh, you know, the, the alcohol content is at 0.5 or less. It's just as simple as that. We have to, we can't make an exception uh, because a batch comes in at 0.6. Okay. Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I, you know, I said, obviously, that's one aspect which was, um, you know, it was a, there was a lot of impacts on it because it was a small business, it was about setting a new product and all that kind of piece, and, and, and there's been established and ongoing sales on that now for a while in the retail space, so I recognize this is kind of solidifying around that space. Um, and there's also been a large movement, as, you know, including in the craft industry in terms of bringing in products to meet um, different, different needs, and, and so that low alcohol or no alcohol space um, where 0.5 and under is considered to be effectively you know, that, that safe space is, is absolutely a real opportunity. We've got multiple producers here in PEI um, who have identified that as a growth opportunity in the market. So I'm, I'm excited to see this here. I am concerned um, um, that you're going to see, you know, that, that there are going to be some potential challenges in, in that, that area where it's right on the line. Um, but the, you know, the overall intent obviously is, is about clarity. For, for those producers, and I, and I understand that context. I'm just really hopeful that that has been done, you know, in consultation with all, the, not just the large producers, but those small craft spaces as well. I think it's a great opportunity for them, and and I mean federally, the, the you know the threshold is is one percent, but yeah. you know majority of the provinces and territories ha use 0.5, so that's the cutoff. And if we were at one percent and they come in at 1.1, it would be no different. So you know we had we had to pick a, a number, and that is the number. So I think it's, it's it is a great opportunity, though I think for all of those microbreweries for sure. Charlottetown Belvedere. Yeah, I have some questions on another section, if that's okay, Chair. I just wanted to look at section two regarding the um, holder, and I understand that this is this is sort of to do with the um, basically bring your own bring your own bottle is kind of I guess the best more colloquial way to interpret <laughs> or, or bring your own wine. Um, and again, sort of speaking to to people in the industry, one of the and having been one of the people in the industry in the past, one of the challenges in this is with, with bring your own is that it becomes harder for servers to determine how much somebody has had to drink. Um, and where the responsibility for safe service actually is with the, the server and the establishment, um, how do we manage that kind of limitation um, to reduce the risk of potentially having intoxication and drunk driving, you know, where that responsibility sits with the establishment? Um, so do you mean just with regards generally to responsible service, or? Um, well, 
when you have bring your own wine, yeah. the server is not the one that's, that's managing and serving how much that person has been served. So like normally oh. the, the practice for responsible okay. service is that the server is expected to maintain and manage right. some kind of an oversight in terms of how many how many drinks have you served. Okay, so, so the, one problem. yeah, so it, the intent is though that, that as a patron, I can bring my own product that I wish to consume into the licensed premise, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to one that's offered off the menu. Mm -hmm. There may not be a change re then just to how it's served, like the, it, it's not like they come in and, and set the bottle down on the table and they begin to consume it. There could the the licensed premise holder could still put in a corkage fee, be responsible for the bottle and for the consumption. It's only that the bottle comes from outside of the licensed premise, not from off off of their inventory. So it's it, it there is still a, a responsibility to to responsible service. Okay. Yeah. Charles M. Belvedere. Thank you, and I appreciate that clarification because yeah. because I think that's exactly the concern yeah. that we heard from the service industry is does this mean you know and, and I think that that would be obviously part of your education campaign mm. would be yes. how this would work in the training part of it because mm -hmm. because that's definitely the concern of, of mm -hmm. someone's going to walk in and say I brought mine thanks very much and yeah. then, then no. but that but there's that gap yeah it's more about I'll call it inventory mm -hmm. like, so what's available off the menu versus what someone may want to to bring in and it does have to be a commercially manufactured bottle of wine. Okay. Thank you, Chair. That actually was going to be my next question. Is, is does homemade homemade alcohol no. count? No. no. So it's another piece of the story no. because uh, that was something else that we've yeah. heard is great. I can bring my own. Yeah. yeah no. So uh, something that has to be purchased but did not have to be purchased directly through the establishment. Right. Uh, you had mentioned, uh, Chair, the, the, uh, the guests had mentioned corkage and, and um, I, I, I'm getting the impression from this that that would be and I may be wrong, but that that would be set by the premises? That's right, yeah. So they can choose if they wish to, to have a fee or not, and they can choose what that fee will be if they wish to, and if that's if they wish to implement this in their in their venue as well. Charlton Belvedere. Okay, so the actual implementation of Bring Your Own would also be at the discretion of the of the venue and whether they choose to participate mm -hmm. in that in that or yep. not. Okay. Um, the... Uh, Chair, the, the, you know, you have um, this thing which is regarding selling from someone other than the commissioner and then serving, so we've talked about the serving, but, but what, um, are there any exceptions that you would expect to put in place regarding selling alcohol that hasn't been, um, come from the commission? Like, is that also, like, what happens if somebody has their own private import list? Um, that was a deep. That was a deep thought there. <laughs> well, um, it actually it's covered a bit in one of the other sections okay. where we talk about personal importation limits. Okay. Um, do Do you want me Let's to? Let's go there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So under the personal importation limits, you'll see that right now there are limits set yeah. as to what you're allowed to bring into the province on your person. Our proposal is that we would remove those limits and therefore also remove. The, the the part that it has to be sold through the PEI Liquor Control Commission. If you were to import on your person a bottle of wine that you purchased, that's manufactured commercially and you've purchased from another liquor jurisdiction, then that could be something that you could then bring into a licensed premise under the bring your own wine change. Okay. Charles M. Belvedere. I mean, this is potentially then, then a very important change, um, but I, I would like if we could just sort of ask some clarity. Um, there is, oh, sorry, there is one other part. Is that you, speaking to your mm. importation list, if you belong to, um, like an example would be someone like the Epimium Society, mm. um, who has a membership, the, the alcohol is, is in fact purchased. It comes, it does come through the Liquor Control Commission. Um, there aren't, they aren't products that are generally listed. There's a, a, a procedure that's in place for that. So that might be something a little bit different as well. Charlotte yeah. Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Well, so what we've, what we've heard people kind of railing against in the past is the limitation of two, two different pieces. One is obviously the, from the Camo case, I mean, the impact of, of, mm -hmm. of crossing the border right. and not understanding or realizing or ignoring the, the, the restrictions. <coughs> and obviously what this does is, is actually take that that limitation away. Am I am I correct? For those people living in Prince Edward Island, yes. Right. So sure, so that's important. You know, um, um, in terms chair, in terms of um, 
having that limit at the moment, which which many people have have um, been charged under. Mm -hmm. I understand. Do you have any idea about how many charges have been laid under that that restriction in the past? I do not have that information, okay. unfortunately. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. What does this allow for people to then, for instance, order alcohol online per no. privately? No. No. It only provides for on your person. So whether that's okay in your trunk of your car, in your luggage on a, some sort of a flight or other means of transportation. There's no online ordering, um, no deliveries, um, so if, there, if you were to be able to order through other means, um, and it doesn't co cover commercial activity, so this is personal use only. Charlottetown Belvedere. Can you explain why that's, that was decided? Why, is the, why has that limitation been maintained when it's not in other provinces? Sorry, which? The, the online Yeah, that you portion? can't order, that it has to be on person, that you can't order like um, wine from Ontario and have it shipped. I do not know the answer to that. <laughs> um, we haven't made provision for direct-to-consumer. That's right. sort of what you're looking for. Yep. Um, and having not been involved in the writing of it, I guess I can't comment on that. Yeah. Uh, Minister? Honourable member, we can bring that back. I'm not sure, you know... <laughs> what the reasoning is behind that, but I think it is because we're talking direct to consumer yeah. versus, you know, purchasing Personal, yeah. at another liquor establishment and bringing it uh, across to, you know, across into the province. Mm -hmm. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. And I recognize that these changes are, are, are obviously, I mean, these are, it's exciting to see that they, they are getting updated and these changes are, are very much about sort of the, the you know, very direct, like you said, direct consumption and so on. That is, however, something that has been raised by a small but vocal percentage of the population about the the, um, the limitations on being able to, to order and purchase and ship. So I can drive to Ontario and buy a case of wine and drive back in my car with it in my car and that's okay but I can't order it online and I guess during COVID in particular that's probably become a bit more of a of a challenge. Um, Mr. Chair, do you have others on your on your list? Uh, just a few. Okay, well then I'll I'll catch my thoughts and maybe come back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Olary and Burness. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Hey>, thanks. <laughs> Welcome, Heather. Um, I guess I have I always had a couple of issues. I brought it up here, and I think it's section four that uh, that I'm dealing with here. And I come back to the issue about bringing wine into your uh, restaurant, mm -hmm. but. It, as I understood, you couldn't take beer in. So in other words, a, a growler. So if you went to Moth Lane Brewery, I'll always give them a little plug here, and uh, mm -hmm. when I order a growler, I can't go upstairs and eat with that growler. And that seems like a, an illogical policy, I guess, from a Liquor Control Commission perspective. And I'm just, I'm sure you're prepared for this question, but... <laughs> so can you tell me, will this correct this, or what's it take to correct this? Um, the, the alcohol that's purchased in your example of a growler is meant to be taken away and consumed off of that premise. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. Well, there you <laughs> But I can go to a winery, and can I not take one, or, or just go into that same premise and take a bottle of wine in but, and, uh, and uh, have that while I'm dining? Why can't I beer? <laughs> well, at this stage, we're only dealing with wine. Um, at some other stage, we may be dealing with other forms of alcohol, but right now it's only beer, or only wine. Beer, for the purpose of pouring it in a growler, is, is really intended for, under their sales license to be able to be consumed off of their premises. Valerian Burness. But does that not seem illogical, I guess is what I'm trying to say. If I, if I could go to that Moth Lane Brewery that has a restaurant and I can bring a bottle of wine in, but I can't take a growler up, it's, uh, uh, yeah. even, even if I was taking a growler from right. another brewery, let's even make it, try to simplify mm. it a bit. So my question then ultimately will, so if this, <coughs> is, does it take an amendment to, to change that, or what's it take to change that? <coughs> or like you said, bring it back uh, another uh, time? Previously we discussed this, and part of it is there's no, you, you're not, you don't seal a growl, growler when you purchase it from, um, you know, a brewery. It's not, there's not a, like a, a label over it to keep it, yeah. In all of them, there's not. But uh, this is one step, and we're continuing to moderni modernize the Liquor Act, and we'll continue to do that. I mean, you bring up one issue, as we talked about now, you know, being able to, to, to bring wine or liquor across into the province on your person. Uh, now the next issue is, okay, now we want to order it online. So, you know, duly note it, and, and uh, I'll be happy to bring that back to... to 
Yeah. Chair? Well, there Amber does. So I'm quite confident that if all it took was a sticker <laughs> over the top of a yeah. growler to uh, form some sort of a seal to determine whether it's broken, uh, I'm sure the uh, Craft Brewery Industry Association of PEI would be more than happy to accommodate that. So, so I guess ultimately I'm just saying, Minister, would, would you uh, be willing to bring back yeah. at, we'll say, the next sitting of the legislature uh, in the spring to uh, make that uh, change to whatever is required? It's, it, it has to do, uh, Honourable Member, with licensing as well, and then uh, the markup when you purchase a, you know, sealed bottle of wine at the liquor store versus a growler at the microbrewery. But all things that we're willing to look at and come up with a solution if we can. Mm -hmm. Well, Larry Inverness? Well, I appreciate that because, like I said, it just seems like a... a a rule that doesn't seem to make sense, and I think I think we have uh, a fairly strong craft brewing industry in Prince Edward Island, and I'm looking yep. forward to the, the sip and slurp again <laughs> to sort of to uh, check some of those things out. That, that but these are island products, and I think they, uh, I know the local brewery at my place. Uh, we discuss this when I have my meetings down there on issues that pertain to the brewery industry. And my other final point would be just I get this a lot, and and it might be addressed somewhere in the 0.5 percent part, but uh, you know I keep hearing about non alcohol alcoholic beer that I, I can't get it in the grocery store. I have to get it at the liquor store. And for people who have challenges uh, with addiction, they, they feel it's kind of the wrong spot to put it. So I, and I'm, I think about the Budweiser, uh, whatever the name of the black, it's a black label or whatever. Okay. So this will correct this? It will. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, good. Yeah. Okay, it's, thanks. It's, thanks, it's, Chair. it's one of the concerns that I hear of the most from the public, yeah. too, is, you know, not feeling comfortable going into a liquor store to, to buy it, but would like to see it at the grocery store. So it's what we're doing here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Transportation and infrastructure? Thank you. Um, and I'm pretty sure you already answered my question, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, this would only pertain to licensed restaurants. Like, uh, we know, like, especially in the greater Charlottetown area, there's a multitude of uh, ethnic restaurants that have opened up that, that do not have a, a liquor license. So yeah, they'd it, have to be licensed. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Charlottetown Brighton. The member just took uh, the minister just took away my question. Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, one of the things I enjoy when I go to Quebec, I think uh, you can go into a restaurant and if they don't have a liquor license, you can bring your own bottle. Uh, is that a step you're considering in the future, or is there a problem with that? Honourable member, baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for sure. But we are continually modernizing the act, and, yeah. and, and it's great to have input from everyone to see, you know, what concerns are there. And, and uh, you know, we have to look at the logistics around that. And, and right now, I would guess that, you know, it's it's would be a change to the act for that, for sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl Town West Royalty. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, I'm enjoying debate here, and uh, as I'm sitting here, I, I, I'm just... I'm just want, continuing to ask myself, what, what is this? What is this solving? Like the the whole the, the whole idea about take. I'm I'm just kind of just want to get your sense of is this uh, where did this issue come from and why are we? Is this just a modernization or is this like uh, what, which which of the well bringing bringing uh, bringing liquor into establishments? I guess I'm just looking for a general like why. Be, for me to answer that, I would say, yes, it is just a modernization of the Act. It's something that can be done in other jurisdictions. And, you know, we continually look at how we can make, uh, I guess, better choices for Islanders. It's still done in a responsible way, and we'll continue to make sure that it is done responsibly. That's why there would be possibly a corkage fee and that the the server would be responsible for, for the serving of the liquor. So just, it again, c coming up to the times, I guess, bring our, our Act up to the times. Charlottetown West Royalty. Was looking at your jurisdictional jurisdictional scans and looking across. Was there any pitfalls that 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 struck you by putting this in in other areas or any any uh, issues in other areas that you? No, not, not, no, that we're aware of. No. Okay. Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, we had we had uh, we talked about in the standing committee the social responsibility side of things, the, the financing into the PEI Liquor Commission where you have a social responsibility to curb drinking, make sure that it stays out of certain people's hands. Um, that to me seemed potentially underfunded. Is there any 
with, with this going in, um, would there be any, <coughs> I know there's an educational campaign, but is there any ideas about funding that more or helping people with the educational piece to make sure that we're making sure that people drink responsibly? I, I think there's an ongoing, uh, you know, I guess, thought and processed to, that is part of what the the department thinks about all the time we want people to drink socially responsible and i i mean modernizing some of the act i think some people would argue that it it's pushing people to drink more but i would i would disagree i would say it's it's a way of ensuring that people have access when they want it and have access to you know low alcohol um, products i think that you know that's a that's a really good thing because people would like to purchase those items at a grocery store so i think continually we work with with the liquor commission to ensure that social responsibility is definitely part of the message and i have no problem committing that i'll have that conversation again with uh, the ceo to see what else we can do charlottetown west royalty and it's just it's yeah it's just my concern with alcohol it seems like we're coming out of a pandemic and and you know I'm just, I'm just worried about alcohol responsibility, drinking and driving, those type of things. And it, it's, I'm all, all for modernizing things, but it just, there's something just, I'm just kind of worried. I know this is just a small step, but, but I worry about that. Um, just, just, can you touch on the, the I know this is, uh, there, there's a tax of 25% per liter applied to breweries when they deliver kegs to restaurants. And it generates around uh, 368,000 dollars per year. Is there any discussion about that? Member, is that yeah. pertaining to the bill? Mm. No. No. I guess not, Chair. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, another question? <laughs> no, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, leader of the third party? Thanks, Chair. Can I just go back to the non-alcohol beer? Is that only in the liquor stores now or is it in any of the grocery stores? It it's supposed to be only in liquor stores right now. It's <laughs> yeah. the percentage. Percentage, yeah, the percentage is 0.5 or less. Is 0.5 or less is what we're looking at being able to have yeah. in general retail. Okay. Right now it's it's less than that. So there are some products who meet that threshold, but most do not. Okay. And Leader of the third party. Thank you. So is an establishment allowed to order every, any kind they want, or is there restrictions on what they can order? Oh, no, they can order what they like, and if they're a licensed premise, they can sell products like they currently would have that higher alcohol, like when I say higher alcohol content that are above zero, um, and serve that as alcohol under the definition, that's what it would be, but they can serve what they like if they have a, if they have a, a license. Yeah. Uh, Charlottetown Belvedere. Um. I guess my last, my last question, or maybe not my last, one of my last questions <laughs> on this chair, um, there have, it's coming from something my colleague from Charlton Brighton has said as well, there has been discussion about um, consumption in public areas, um, for example, parks, <coughs> and I know this was raised um, in, during the pandemic as well, so it's about encouraging people to be able to drink inside rather than in confined areas, which is actually shown to be sort of better for, you know, like actually responsible alcohol consumption rather than drinking alone, frankly. Um, is this one of the, something that your department has looked at? Because I know right now we're talking about very specific spaces. Mm -hmm. It's called a social district. Uh, it, again, would be another change to the act. So. Okay, so that's a future consideration yeah. in, in context. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you'd mentioned chair for me. Oh, sorry, yeah. Cheryl, Cheryl Tampa. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and again, just to be, to be clear, so then, so then we're looking at in, within the context of this, it's a clear definition of, of what is considered low alcohol, which will allow for those that meet that threshold to be sold in retail. Right now, they are selling in retail at the brewery space. I'm thinking of Upstreet in my in my district and others. Um, but this would mean that Sobies could carry could carry. And, and when would that take effect? What is the date? Is there a proclamation date? Don't have a date. There, there's no date as of yet, so once we have the act passed and uh, we'll move forward from that and I'll let the House know or let it, let everyone know through uh, communication when, when that'll happen. Yeah. Charlottetown Belvedere. I mean, personally, I've actually got three, maybe four breweries in my district, so I'm, you know, I mean, I hear this is, I, I'm really excited about that opportunity because I do think it, um, there is data that shows that it actually does provide for more responsible choices. Um, it would be really... Um, 
good for our, for our industry <coughs> and for the for these small businesses in particular that this could come into effect in time for the Christmas season, for example. Um, and so I would I would ask that that be considered that that um, that there was an opportunity for those sales to become an option um, in in time for that season. My other question, though, Chair, if I may, is that we've had a lot of conversations with the Retail Council of Canada and the uh, convenience stores um, who have also been lobbying for um, a, a, a ability to sell um, alcohol products in convenience stores. And it's a, it's a really challenging conversation because of the connection to drinking and driving in particular. Um, will these low alcohol products be able to be sold in local convenience stores? Any 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 retailer any retailer that is, has an interest in in selling them, okay. is, is more than uh, able to. And uh, I mean, again, I, I've been reached out by all of those people too yeah. as well. And it's it's a challenge for yeah. sure, and uh, something that that we're trying to find an answer for. Um, but I'd also just recommend to all the house that if you're hearing issues regarding alcohol or liquor to <coughs> to, to get in touch with me because it tends to be you know the most. Uh, the most the most concerns you have are what come to the forefront, and one of them for sure was uh, the low percentage of alcohol. So we want to try and address you know what the pu general public are uh, really concerned about yep. with the act. So we'll just continue to do that. So, yeah. Yep. Cheryl Town Belvedere. And, and I appreciate and recognize um, they may feel like small changes. Mm -hmm. You know when we look at but but that you know this act well, these things all have consequences and I, and I appreciate but I also appreciate the opportunity that we can then come back with sort of what are the next set and do these in a series of stages rather than trying to do these huge overhauls which sometimes get bogged down frankly we've seen with other legislation in here you know that it, it's we talk about doing it for years because there's so much on the agenda so this is a great way to achieve changes that can directly impact the industry and, and I think a positive way um, and so, you know, I said my, my primary concern with this um, minister was, was around um, the risks that come with that, that kind of alcohol service and, and, and the responsible serving. And, and I, I appreciate your feedback on that. And I'm, I'm good with no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I just want to uh, thank Heather Roster for being on the floor. She's, it's the first time she's been the stranger on the floor for me. I don't thank know you. if she's been on for anyone else, but it's great to have her here. Shalva Bell Carey. I move the title. An act to amend the Liquor Control Act. Shalva Carey. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shalva Carey. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and the chair report the bill. Uh, Agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Liquor Control Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Should I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of uh, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, that the ninth order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Yes. Order number nine, an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, Bill number 25, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Education, sorry, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, that the said bill be read a second time. Shall it carry? Yes. Bill number 25, an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Edu Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture that this House do now resolve itself in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the same bill. Sure, Kerry. Yes. The Honourable Member for Montague, Kilmore, the Government Whip, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take, take into consideration a bill to be impetual and act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act. Minister, do you wish to bring a stranger on yes, the floor? Yes, please. The request has been made to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? Title for Hansard, please. Yes, Stephen Carpenter. I'm the senior legal advisor with the Workers' Compensation Board of Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, is it the committee's pleasure that the bill be read clause by clause, section by section, or open it up for general questions? General section by section. Okay. Uh, section. Section one. Questions for section one. Shall it carry? Section two. Shall it carry? Yes. Section three. Leader of the third party. Thanks, Chair. Section three. There was a change to to ensure pre-existing physical and psychological conditions are treated equally in calculating benefits. Has there been situations where the two are not treated equally? Where they are not treated equally? Mm. No. We we do treat them equally. Um, this will solidify that. It's, it's simply an update in language. Um, when the act was originally written, psychological conditions weren't at the, the forefront, to say the least. So this is really doing what we practice now at the board, is, is giving equal weight to psychological injuries. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Uh, Ty Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, and I apologize. Um, I did have a question that I, I thought it was in Section 2, but it is in Section 1, so I'm hoping I can just quickly ask that if that's sure. okay. Just wondering if you can explain the rationale for removing exemptions for the construction industry. Uh, the construction industry, sorry, I think you're in another section there, is but it? I, okay, I will sorry. speak to that. But Thank you. Um, uh, generally, under the Act, there's a, an obligation to, to re-employ or accommodate injured, injured workers when they return mm -hmm. from an injury. And there was, um, or and there currently is, if this doesn't pass, an exemption where the construction industry is not bound by that same obligation to re-employ. So this would uh, remove that exemption and require uh, the construction industry to uh, treat recovering workers who were trying to return to the workplace the same as those employers who are not in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the effect of that. Mm -hmm. that Ty Yeah, thank you, Chair. I know that certainly sounds like a, a positive change. Uh, can you just uh, uh, share a bit about uh, consultations uh, with the Construction Industry Association, perhaps, and what their thoughts were on this? Uh, we did. We received feedback from the construction industry, and um, the feedback was positive. Generally. The construction industry, like most employers in PEI, work hard with recovering workers to get them back into the workplace anyway. So it's not um, anything that's going to cause any, any difficulty to the construction industry. Time Valley Sherbrooke. That's all for now, Chair. Thank you. Uh, shall the section carry? Very <laughs> Section 4. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. So I do have um, just some questions about indexation. So perhaps uh, uh, maybe we can just start, you know, the bill adjusts the indexation formula for the benefits that injured workers receive and uh, brings it up to 100% of CPI. So I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about how the adjustment is calculated. It's calculated every every year. So in July of every year, there is, there is a, an adjustment. So uh, for the sake of easy math, let's say a worker is receiving uh, $500 a week, um, and that's going on for the course of 12 months. Um, July of each year, that weekly benefit would be adjusted by, by CPI, so the cost of living. Currently, workers only get adjusted 80% of CPI. 
this amendment would take them to 100% CPI adjustment, so they keep up 100%, in other words, to inflation. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a significant uh, benefit enhancement for the worker community. Time, Valley Sherbrooke. Yeah, thank you. So that's really great to see. I mean, you know, certainly bringing that up to uh, recognize the uh, indexation on the full, you know, CPI uh, amount uh, to represent cost of living there is a huge, huge uh, step forward. So I'm glad to see that. But I just, I wondered if you could talk, uh, share a bit about the impact of that uh, compact, uh, sorry, compounding amounts over time. So with it being at, you know, only 80% of CPI. Um, if you were receiving, an in, if you were an injured worker receiving benefits for 10, 20 years, you know, what impact might that have had over time? Well, well, your, your point is well taken, um, and there's no way to hide it. If you were on benefits for the last 10 years, for example, and you were getting indexed only 80 percent, then you are, in a sense, falling behind. Um, the, the system, though, really to go back and, and remedy that is not is not a place we'd want to go that that would effectively uh, require the legislative amendment to <clears throat> to operate back in time to go back in time or to operate retroactively is what we call that um, my my concerns around retroactivity of this type of legislation with the workers compensation scheme would be generally a few things and if I may just make a couple of points Generally, courts have told us that presumptively legislation is, is not retroactive. Um, there's, there's problems with that. Take, for example, this process we're going through today. There's a first reading of a bill, a second reading. This is televised to the public. The point of the legislative exercise really is what courts will tell us, so people know what's, what's coming at them in terms of rights and obligations. And when you travel back in time, that negates that process, that consultation process, the transparency of this type of a process. So that's really why courts have issues with it. The, the second or third point perhaps I'd make, and this is perhaps most importantly, but we're at the Workers' Compensation Board always balancing with the employer community and the, and the worker community. We have made a lot of significant worker benefit enhancements over years and we want to continue to do that we're always looking at ways to uh, make life better for workers in terms of their recovery their rehabilitation their compensation if every time we think of a, a benefit or an enhancement we have to kind of think about the concern of operating back in time uh, that it might operate retroactively i'm afraid that might hamstring uh, the board a little bit in terms of how aggressive it can be in, in continuing to um, enhance the system for workers. Mm -hmm. Time to Thank you so much for, for that uh, uh, detailed description of what some of the challenges might be there. Um, I, you know, I think the other part of that, though, uh, is that we have to look at it as well from the perspective of those injured workers, right? So, you know, if let's say I was an injured worker and, you know, 20 years ago I was a minimum wage worker and I was injured on the job. Um, already you were, you know, at a low benefit amount, but that year after year it's been indexed below a cost of living level. At this point, you know, you would really not be anywhere near an amount that would allow you to meet your basic needs, right? So, uh, so that to me, no matter, it, it, that, that's a big enough problem, a significant enough issue that we need to really find a way to address that. Now, I don't want to hold back the the work of this particular amendment because I do think it's a, a very good step that moving forward, um, the indexation will happen at 100% of CPI. That is, it's, it's a, going to benefit a lot of people. Um, but for those who have, have already fallen behind, um, it's not going to come anywhere near bringing them to a level um, that they really need to be to to meet their just you know the day to day cost of living. Um, so, you know, I'm wondering if there's any um, are there any plans to to take a look as a next step at, at this that secondary issue because uh, the intention of this bill to me is is a very good one to ensure that you know the indexation is happening uh, at a rate that reflects the cost of living. 
um, for injured workers. Is there any, um, are there any plans to look at that further beyond the scope of this particular bill, I guess? The only thing I could tell you is that we, we constantly look at the system, the act and our policies to better, to make the system better for everyone involved, including workers. To your specific question is that um, I'm not aware of anything, you know, to try to fix the situation you described, the worker who was on benefits for 20 years, I, I don't see a way to really fix that other than essentially travel back in time and, <clears throat> and that's the concerns about retroactivity. What we, what we try to focus on at the board is learning from the past, looking forward, following other jurisdictions, listening to our constituents, our stakeholders, and try to make the system better on a go-forward basis. Time, Dolly Sherbrooke. So I, yeah, abs I mean, I certainly hear the challenges in trying to address this uh, retroactively, um, and we'll never be able to do that to the full uh, amount. In that, you know, we'd never be able to to uh, to compensate for all of the lost years uh, where people were not have not been receiving, um, you know, the full amount that they they really should have based on the intention of this bill. I do hear what you're saying, um, but I can't. I, what I can't let go of, and I just can't is, you know, thinking about those workers who have been injured on the job, you know, through no fault of their own. Um, these are workers who were out, you know, doing their job and, and were injured to a point where they, they can't work any longer and that, you know, those people deserve, you know, dignity and, and to be able to live with basic health and dignity and, and we're not at a point where everybody who has, has experienced that is, is going to be able to do that. This is a good step. This, this bill is going to make, have an impact, but, you know, perhaps my question here is to the minister, you know, if, if you would be willing to um, continue to look into this, uh, and I would be very, very happy to engage in those discussions uh, as they move forward, because I really, I, I cannot let go of, of, of those workers who have, are still going to be falling short after this is passed. Yeah, certainly, Honourable Member. I know we've had discussions on this, and, um, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we, we've kind of gone back and forth, and, and I guess we all are on the same page in the understanding of it. It's just if, if anything can be done. So what I can commit is, is certainly after we get this session done, we could get everyone around a table and do a little brainstorming just to see if there's anything, uh, anything that can be done. Obviously, there's no guarantees with that. Uh, you know, when the department explained to me on the legal side of it, and the, uh, making it retroactive, it, it makes sense. Um, but at the same time, I, I certainly feel we can look at it in a, in a bigger lens just to see if there's anything we're missing, and uh, I have no problems uh, sitting down doing that. Okay, good. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. the third party. Was there a jurisdictional scan? I mean, thanks for bringing this forward, and you said just try to do what you can for injured workers. Like, what's the reasoning for this now, like, to, to add this now where it wasn't there before? Well, I don't think anything necessarily prompted it other than, you know, we've had, uh, we've been looking at benefit enhancements over the last couple of years really, uh, really hard, and this was one that was felt, um, certainly would be, um, it'll be a cost to the employer community, but not, not a great cost at all, so it's a significant enhancement. Um, I think you were asking about other jurisdictions. Um, many, there are other jurisdictions that have, uh, uh, that have gone to 100% of CPI. Some still don't, um, but it was one that we felt with the financial position um, of the board that, um, that, that would be reasonable and would maintain that balance between the employer community and, and workers. Um, so we went ahead and did it. Leader of the third party. This may not be a fair question, but I'll ask you just in case it is a fair question. Go ahead. So can you give us an example? If somebody was getting $1,000 a month, what's this going to get them? Um, I did uh, do some scratching. It's, it, first of all, what a little bit of background when um, CPI um, in the last year, last 20 years, we have it capped at 4 percent, as you know, in this, this amendment. It's 100 uh, percent of CPI to a maximum of 4 percent. 
Um, in the last past 20 years, the CPI for Charlotte and Summerside has never actually exceeded 4%. Four, four we're, we're in a high inflationary period right at the moment, but that's, I'm not a macro economist, but I think there's probably reasons to, that, that that's probably a blip. Um, over the past 20 years, though, it has dipped into the negative, I think, on four occasions. Um, the board does not adjust benefits to the negative, though. Okay, we've they've never done that. So just so you know that. Um, but as for an example on the math, just give me one second. I did. I did have. Uh, so, let's say you're getting a thousand dollars monthly now as a benefit, um, and come July of each year, I mentioned we would do an adjustment. For CPI, currently it's 80%. That would equal a $24 adjustment, $1,000 to 1,024 going forward for the next year. Um, if we took that $1,000 monthly benefit and we did 100% of CPI, like, which say let's say it was 3% CPI at that time, it would be a $30 adjustment per month. So six dollars in the difference. So it's not may not sound like a, a lot, but it uh, it is meaningful over the course of time. Leader of the third party. That's that's good for now. Thanks. Uh, Cheryl Tam Brighton. Good uh, chap. No, I appreciate the difficulties going back in time and uh, adding up the difference, and that and the uh, this legislation doesn't. Do that, but there's another aspect of it. Um, let's say you have uh, two persons, and they receive receive what they are a recipient for the same uh, cause type of thing. If somebody has been uh, receiving benefits for ten years, they uh, they are losing ground with the with the fact that those 10 years that didn't have the uh, didn't have the 100% uh, benefit but now we in this particular year we have uh, these two persons that are, should be a recipient of the same thing is the first person sort of stuck in a lower recipient for the future because he received less in the past or does he get adjusted up to the same level as the new recipient Recipient. Um, I'm not sure I understand your question, but to, to answer it, what I think you're asking me is the the person who has has been on benefits for for ten years, for example, um, in in one sense will remain behind because the way it the way it works is. Um, you take your benefit amount in July of each year, you add the CPI adjustment to that. That amount you go forward with for the next year, July of that next year, you make another adjustment based on CPI. So um, I think to answer your question, the person who's been on benefits for 10 years, um, there's nothing about this amendment that's really going to catch them up. Um, they're going to be treated the same on a go-forward basis. Charles they're, they're going to get 100% of CPI. Yeah. No, I, th I think yeah. you understood what I'm saying, and and that is a differential. That is a differential treatment of two different persons. So, and it's um, we're not talking about the retroactive benefits. We are going forward, and you're still treating them different. And I think. That seems unfair, and you should be looking into that for sure. You see what I mean? This, this, this like uh, a, I, you know, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I, I do. Um, again, I just am not aware of any way to to remedy that situation other than somehow traveling back in, in time and making calculations. And that's when we get into a retroactive or a retrospective application of legislation, which is problematic. Um, your points, many of you are taking, aren't lost. Um, but, you know, we, I do take some pride in the system 
um, on a go-forward basis being, uh, being made better, um, benefits being enhanced for workers whilst continuing to strike that balance with the employer community as well. Charles Albright. Um, out of the hard works and other payments like, uh, but I assume that uh, if you get old age supplement payment or something like that, it doesn't matter what year you started that, that every recipient get the same amount. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you. Um, Shall the section carry? Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry Leader, Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. I just want to follow up on that because you've used the word a couple of times that it's problematic to do this retroactive mm -hmm. um, analysis. Problematic in what way and for whom? It's problematic in it, well, I don't want to exaggerate. Legislation can be retroactive if a, if a legislature says so. Generally, um, courts don't like it. Um, and one of the reasons they don't like it is <coughs> legislation is um, supposed to be open to the public for participation, for example. Um, a bill that's being debated here, I can make submissions on that. I can ask my MLA about it, ask my MLA to make submissions for me. Citizens generally have a, a right to know what their rights and obligations are before they're confronted with them. When you travel back in time and make legislation retroactive, you don't have any chance to do that. For, so take, for example, um, if we were to make a retroactive calculation um, for a worker and um, award a lump sum to them, just for example, that would impact the accident fund out of which the payments come. That could impact the employer, for example. Um, and that, hap that for something that happened really 10 years ago, for example. So you see my point, it's when you travel back retroactively, the whole point and purpose of the legislative process and consultation is, is eroded. So it's problematic in that sense. The people who generally should know their rights and obligations on a go-forward basis and have an opportunity to prepare for them and speak to them. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. And I, it's an interesting conversation. It strikes me that any retroactivity which would be associated with the changes that at least I hear a couple of members of my caucus suggesting would be possible, are, they would be entirely fiduciary. These would be just financial. And I understand that that would have an impact on those who pay into this fund. I, I get that. Yeah. Um, but surely that wouldn't, it doesn't mean that this would not be possible to do. And I, I'm not sure that anybody's rights would be in any way infringed in terms of consultation with the process, because the act, all, all we're doing here is creating a fiduciary um, commitment to those who are already committed to funding this program. I, I, do, I do see it as a retroactive effect, uh, what you're describing. <clears throat> Um, and in terms of the, the consequences of that, I, I, do, I do think, and I have, no, I have no opinion one way or the other. I'm just trying to tell you the way it is. I would think, you know, on a go-forward basis, as, as the Workers' Compensation Board really looks at, um, there's a lot of things in the future. The dynamics of the workplace are changing. There's a lot of possible worker benefit enhancements on the horizon, maybe, you know, like, I think if the effect of a legislative amendment is that it's going to have a retroactive implication, however you want to describe it, but to make someone compensated for what happened over the past 10 years, it is a retroactive application of a, of a legislative amendment. I think if the board, I think, would have concerns that you know, the next time the board goes to introduce an enhancement that it might go retroactive and it could have a little bit of a, a chilling effect. I'd, I'd much prefer personally to see the board 
grow, learn from the past, and develop a robust and uh, system and a better system on a go forward basis, then the point is not lost on anyone in this room, I don't think. There are, there are workers who have been on benefits for 10, 15 years, um, have been getting adjusted, um, not in keeping 100% with the cost of living. That, that's not lost on anyone, but I think the, the answer to that is let's make the system better as we move forward. And truthfully, that's a big part of why this is here today for that reason, right? Um, over the really the last 10 days, we've gone back and forth on this and just asking these same questions as, as well. And there just doesn't seem to be an easy path forward. But in saying that, I don't think, like we, we talked about, well, if we were to look at that any further, we'd have to pull this. And we said, no, let's not do that. Let's get this and then go back and see if there's anything that can be done. Maybe there is something we're missing on it. Um, so, we're, which I've agreed to kind of go back and take a, take a second look at it. But um, everything that's being told to me, and I'm no expert by no means, is that it would be a challenge possibly legally if somebody was to challenge it. Uh, which is the last thing we want to get into. But at the same time, I don't think we'll just walk away and wipe our hands clean of it. I think it's worth a second look just to see if anything can, can be done. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. And I appreciate that, Minister, and I appreciate your explanation as well. And I, and I also appreciate the fact that we are correcting this going forward, and that's something that needs to be acknowledged. And I do that, and, and um, members of my caucus have also acknowledged that this is the right thing to do. Uh, and it's just that the argument that we cannot do something retroactively is something that I, you know, I'm not completely buying here. Any program that is based um, where a payment is based on CPI is inherently unpredictable. So we can't make the assumption that the people who are funding this know from one year to the next what their payments are going to be. So uh, I understand this. This involves. Um, a certain amount of unpredictability and um, an onus that perhaps was not there before, but one never knows what the onus is going to be from one year to the next going forward anyway. But I just, I'm, I'm glad to have this conversation. I really feel I've been educated on this a little more, and uh, I appreciate the, the fact that we had time to do this in the House. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Charlottetown Bright. I just want to emphasize again that I'm not talking about a retroactive payment in any way. That what I'm concerned about wouldn't trigger any kind of lump sum payment or anything like that. What I'm talking about is two workers, one of which started claiming 10 years earlier that kind of receiving the same com com uh, compensation that going forward one isn't starting with $800 a month and the other one $900 a month. They should be treated equally. They, they, they will be, I, I think, to answer your question, just in case you don't know, the, the system is complicated and you, if I sit here long enough, you're eventually <laughs> going to ask me a question I don't know the answer to. But they are treated equally in the sense of it's based on your, um, your actual wages. You get 85% you know, of your actual net earnings, um, which is uh, not taxable. And then you get that for the year and then you get your, your CPI adjustment so um, so going forward and it, it's always in the case everyone is is treated the same in the sense that it's, it's your wage loss benefits your actual benefits you get are are hinged on how much what your earnings were at the time of the accident and you get 85 percent of your net earnings um, and then you will get your CPI adjustment go going forward the the worker who was injured 10 years ago is going to get a 100 percent CPI adjustment just as uh, the person whose claim just came came in the door so to speak so I think they're I think they will be treated fairly I think so the worker the injured worker who's been on for 10 years will not be caught up in the sense of that lost CPI though in the past when they were only given CPI adjustments at 80 percent. There's no sort of catch-up mechanism in these legislative amendments to address that. I don't know if I'm being clear or not. I, I don't know I if think, I answered your I question. Think well, it was, Steve, is it, if somebody is hurt today yeah. and what the payment is and somebody was hurt 10 years ago and what the payment was 10 years ago, 
I think what all these or the honorable member from Brighton is saying is if it was the same injury, one from 10 or 15 years ago, one to today, they should be treated with the same pay scale. I think that's my understanding. Well, uh, Cheryl Down Brighton. Yes. Uh, thank you, Minister. That is more or less it, but uh, was it 85% that the adjustment was before? Yeah. So I guess really my – so I'm not speaking about that the workers should be paid for the stuff that they didn't receive. But really what I'm saying is shouldn't they – shouldn't you go back and, and do the calculation of uh, – I, th I think – Of, 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 uh, of 100% back when it started and bring it up so that's the number you use from now on in the future without any cash payments for the back. I think we understand, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Honourable Member. I think, yeah. I think that wouldn't apply to this amendment, though. I think that's separate what, what you're uh, implying. Um, but this, this, wouldn't, this wouldn't fall under that, from my understanding. Am I right in saying that? You're right. I, I do understand your question now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And, you know, I really appreciate this, this discussion here. Um, I, I think one of the things that has, has struck me is that as we're talking about this, this issue that, you know, that won't be identified by this particular amendment of uh, workers who, uh, over, you know, compounding uh, years, that amount, uh, indexation amount, has not been at, at a living uh, a living, livable amount is not being at 100% of uh, the CPI. It's, it's been less, and that's compounded over time. That's a problem for sure. Um, I think what we're the, in thinking about how we are, might address that, though, in the future, we're sort of we've started with the end of the conversation with well, we can't do this thing. We can't do it this particular way. Um, I'd like us to, and this is what I'm hoping we can do uh, after you know, moving forward, uh, you know, after this discussion, um, and hopefully we can come forward with a solution is, is, is start from the place that there are workers, there are injured workers right now who are not able to make, you know, their, meet their basic needs because of the problem of uh, their benefit amounts not being properly indexed year after year. Now, no one's saying lump sum. We should never, we should not say lump sum again. That is not the, you know, the concern here. We can't go back in time. And we, I wish we could have a time machine. But what we can do is try to find, we need to find a solution so that moving forward, those people have a fair benefit amount. And, you know, you, there, you may have sort of one possible um, way of solving that in mind that, you, that won't work, but we need to find a way that will. Um, I don't know what that answer is yet, but I, I really do hope that the, the commitment from the minister here is genuine, and I do believe it is, that we find a way to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to those discussions. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 5. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 6. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 7. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 8. Leader of the third party. Thanks. Section 8, the board has authority to suspend, withhold, or redirect compensation to a person who, in the opinion of the board, has been qualified to receive compensation. Can you give us some examples of this, and uh, have we experienced any of these situations in PEI? Yes. Um, some of the amendment here being proposed is simply updating language to be uh, more modern, but um, what the section accomplishes is there are, there are real-life examples. I've been at... Uh, the board is a legal advisor for two years or more now, and there's I can think of two to three examples of this where, for example, a uh, one of the, the best examples perhaps is where a worker is incarcerated, uh, the worker is in receipt of benefits, and the worker has dependents at home, uh, perhaps has a um, maybe there's a common law spouse and there's children involved, and we're trying to direct payments. Uh, to, to get the payments in the hands of the people who need them while the workers incarcerated. This, this amendment just makes those type of uh, situations where the equities really require money to be redirected with, with good reason, it allows us to do that. And there are real life examples of it, yes. Leader of the third party. Thanks for now. I just thank you for, uh, yeah. for these efforts that you're putting forward. 
Shall the section carry? Carry. carry. Section 9. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 10. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 11. Shall it carry? Carry. Section 12. Shall it carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Thanks, Steve. Okay. I'm entitled to go. Okay. Good. I move the title. An act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Donna Bill, Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, and Public Safety that the sixth order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Order number six, an act to amend the Winter Wellness Day Act, Bill number 31, ordered for second reading. Donna Bill, Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, and Public Safety that the said bill be read a second time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 31, an act to amend the Winter Wellness Day Act, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, and Public Safety. This House to now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Carry. The Honorable Member from Monocle Kilmore to chair the committee of the whole House, please. Love to. A committee of the whole house to take into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the winter wellness day act a uh, request has been made to bring a stranger on the floor thank you If you could introduce yourself and your title for Hansard, please. John Cummings, Executive Director of Education Services. Thank you, John. Is it the committee of the, the pleasure of the committee that the bill be opened up to general questions or? Okay, perfect. Any questions, members? Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Um, so, yeah, we're changing the date. How did the first okay. Winter Wellness Day go? The, the, the first Winter Wellness Day was, uh, I think, very successful. I think, uh, you know, schools uh, employed a variety of activities, um, either inside or, or outside. And I think they tried to get 
you know, as many outside activities as, as they possibly could. I think, you know, uh, as uh, the day continues to evolve in future years, I think it will only grow and there will be more, more and more uh, activities incorporated into the day. So I think, you know, it's been, it's been well received. Yeah. Cheryl, tell us. I know every uh, school kind of did their own, their, their own thing. Um, I understand why the date was changed. Um, I, I did make some uh, references to how important it is for high school students to be active during a stressful time in their lives. Um, that's going through exams and going through that process too. Um, is there any? Is there any? Um, so this will allow. The high school students to play is but is there anything for the high school students to talk about their wellness and activity as they go through you know the exam period it's a very stressful time for them yeah so I think I think the individual schools would would definitely be open to you know working with with students as they as they do on a regular basis through that, that <coughs> period of exams as we all can attest it it's a stressful time and uh, I think that schools do do that and, and will continue to focus on that. I think what this allows, this change, is that there will be uh, a date that, that's not, I guess, impacting with exams where potentially the exam schedule could have some students not even there on that particular day. So uh, I think what this is, does is it ensures that it will be a day where, you know, uh, hopefully the whole student body from K to 12 is is in the system and, and has an opportunity to participate. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty? The bills, it, it only allowed for, for minimal disruptions, but, but wellness is so important in the school system. So this was a symbolic thing that the department can run with. It can, mm -hmm. You can have more wellness times. It doesn't have to be in the winter and stuff. So I just encourage you to make sure you look at that. And, and it was very positive. Uh, Day I went around to a few schools that day and trained almost or worked with about 800 kids. So everybody seemed excited, and this is something positive, especially coming out of a pandemic. So I'll conclude my remarks there. So thank you, Minister. Thank you, John. Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I don't really have much of a question, more of a comment. And uh, the, the original draft that was shared with us had, had a conflict with. Uh, when exams might be and uh, actually it was going to be a PD day so uh, with some input and some consultation is a very small example of uh, how reaching out can improve the outcomes for Islanders here Minister so I just encourage you to do that more often. Thank you. Any further questions? Members? Shall the bill carry? Carry. Thanks John. <coughs> I move. Sorry? The chair. Okay. I move the title. An act to amend the Winter and Wellness Day Act. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Carry. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole house, having had, up, had under consideration a bill to be an actual church, an act to amend the Winter Wellness down, Day Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed the same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sean Carey. Carey. Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the member from Morel Dona that the 18th order of the day be now read. Shot Carey. Order 18, Loan Act 2021, Bill Number 32, ordered for second reading. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the member from Morel Dona that the said bill be read a second time. Shot Carey. Carey. 
Bill number 32, Loan Act 2021, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Moraldona that this House do now resolve itself into Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Sure, Carrie. The Honourable Member from Monaco Kilmore, the Government Whip, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take, take into consideration a bill to be entitled Loan Act 2021. Stranger, Minister? Request has been made to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? yourself and your title for answer, please. Yes, good afternoon. Gordon McFadgen, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury Board. Thanks, Gordon. Is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause, section by section, or opened up for general questions? General questions. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, last year's Loan Act authorized the province to borrow $250 million. Um, how much of that capacity was used? Um, so far, against that particular loan act, we issued uh, two long-term uh, issuances. Uh, we did a $125 million seven-year for an interest rate of 1.2%, and we did a $100 million ten-year for a 1.85%. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. When we borrow um, at this scale, how does this borrowing affect the overall debt of the province? Does it retire? Does it replace debt that's been retired, or is it is it like, like net debt, or is it um, new debt adding to our total provincial commitment? Okay. Um, starting with the um, sort of the operating budget, we we try to map out what the uh, borrowing or the cash requirements, for that matter, for the province are. Um, we have two uh, two capacities for uh, raising cash short term uh, through uh, T bills. 90-day paper and uh, long-term uh, issuance, um, and, and we're trying to match usually the long-term issuance with the uh, purchase of capital assets. So we've had some pretty robust capital programs over the last couple of years in response to uh, some COVID uh, spending needs and, and trying to keep the economy moving. Um, so these two pieces, one would have been uh, refinancing of, of past debt, and the other one would have been kind of to. Uh, offset some of those purchases of capital assets. Charlottetown Belvedere. Okay, so, so about half of it is, is the refinancing and half of it is, is new net because of yep. that increase into our capital expenditure and the need to underwrite those those okay. expenditures. Gotcha. So why are we seeking only 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 two hundred million <laughs> this year then yep. given that we're still sort of in that same kind of pattern? Are you anticipating a much smaller capital budget, for example? Um well uh Again, this would have been set up with the budget in the spring. I think that identified that we would be looking for um, and hoping to utilize a couple of hundred million. We actually don't have any uh, debt um, expiring or needing refinancing this year, so we were able to kind of reduce the amount that we were looking for for the upcoming year. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. You know, when we talk about these these numbers, and they feel obviously they are very large numbers, but they still you mentioned there's still a lot going out at. at over to term periods with interest rates, yep. um, and so you know where we locked in at sort of 1.2 over seven years, uh, you know that that gives us some confidence that that we're okay. But what happens then? Uh, you know, as our uh, 
our interest rates rise, which they may well do given what's happening sort of with inflation rates at, you know, on a, both a national and a global scale. Um, how much of our debt is locked into low interest rates and, and sort of what's our risk exposure there? There is quite a, a, a list of, of long-term debt and you'll see that uh, most recently when we were able to renew <clears throat> some of that exposure, we've done it at a very low interest rate. So right. we do still have some long-term debt that is at a higher interest rate. So it just depends on where we are, in, you know, in the time, I guess. And uh, But I'll also say that we're very... Um, the department has done a very good job of, uh, you know, when they do borrow, being able to reinvest that money until we need it and actually, you know, cover more than the interest that we are paying. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, a fine balancing act all the time as to, you know, how much do we need and, and you know, how much long-term debt are we going to incur. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, and, and absolutely. I mean, you know, it's one of the things that has been an opportunity with the with the, the low interest rate is not only sort of refinancing, so we can lock in for a longer period of time, what, at, at, you know, what are historic loans, but but that you know, debt is not necessarily a bad thing if we're able to have it at that lower interest rate because we are, like you said, the potential is actually there to to have it be generating at the least covering costs, if not sort of providing some some balance, but that's not the always going to be there. And so, um, you know, is, is there that, that refinancing um, approach is something that is, is an aggressive part of the, the management approach at this stage, would you say? Is that the case? Well, um, what we're trying to do with, with the debt program is trying not to have too many eggs come and do all at one time. So, like, you'd be interested why we took a seven-year debenture out and a ten-year debenture out this year. Well, we actually had some, I call them empty years, where there was no borrowing. So we, we're trying to slide in those. Um, it's like dollar cost averaging. So mm -hmm. they don't have it all coming due at one time. That kind of lessens my interest rate risk. Right. Charlottetown Belvedere. Yeah, and I appreciate it. I remember looking at those tables, and it is, it's, you know, it's like sort of <laughs> what's coming up next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the hour has been called. Okay. Thank Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house, having had under consideration a bill to be intentional, Loan Act 2021, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The uh, sit here. You in? The Honourable Member from Morrell Dona, Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the member from Charlottetown Winslow that this house adjourn until Tuesday, October 26th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Sean Carey. He couldn't see me. <laughs> Have a good weekend, member. Just joking. Okay.